So uh, hello, uh, my name is Zhi Mao. Uh, I just recently graduated from Purdue Universities and uh, I'm now with Samsung Research Americans. So I'm here to summarize the uh, challenges. So uh, in 2023, our challenge uh, receives a lot of participations. In total, we have 500 plus uh, total participants across all the three tracks. And we have received over 300 successful final submissions. So in total, we have awarded 12 teams. So for the first and the third tracks, uh, we have awarded the top three winning teams. The second tracks, we have two subtracts. So there will be six teams awarded for the second tracks. So I think I will have Jen Yu here to present the details about the first tracks. So uh, Jen Yu, can you, can you take over? Oh, yes, Jen. Thank you for your hosting. Uh, let me talk about uh, the first track. So the first track is uh, object detection case. So nowadays, seeing understanding becoming extremely challenging in adverse weather conditions, such as haze, fog, and mist. Uh, and these atmospheric phenomena with smoke particles and emitted water droplets often, resu often result in imageries with nonlinear noise, blur or reduced contrast levels or uh, other color dimming issues. So in this track, we aim to evaluate and advance object action algorithms for robustness on images captured from hazy environments. And participants, they are allowed to use a restoration or enhancement pre-processing step in the detection pipeline. And throughout this challenge, we, we are aiming to encourage more sort of image, single image dehazing, haze quantification and object detection algorithms. And here comes to um, the challenge outcome. We have uh, 177 paired hazy or clean images selected from 12 videos. And there are 240 annotated clean images for vehicle detector training. And we have 60 hazy images for dry run and the, uh, the last 50 hazy images reserved for final testing. Um, and the, the championship, uh, is a team from USTC China, and the second one, um, the second place is a, a is a collaborative team from Xi'an University and Xi'an University of Technology, and third place uh, comes from uh, Song Kyung Kwan University from Korea. And that's all. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jay. Uh, can you stop sharing so I can share? Okay, so now uh, we are looking at the second challenge track. So the second challenge track focuses on atmospheric turbulence mitigations. So this is the second year that we run this challenge and we are bringing in some uh, new perspectives to this challenge. So the atmospheric turbulence mitigation algorithms aim to restore a clean image from a sequence of distorted input. Such distortions usually happens when the images are taken uh, over a long distance or in the hot weathers. So this year we have two subtracts. In uh, subtract one, we continue the theme of previous year where we use the text recognition accuracy to benchmark the uh, mitigation algorithms. So in subtract two, we're collaborating with the C5 ISR Center from US Army to bring you the coded target restoration challenge. So uh, for subtract one, we are using semi-synthetic turbulence data carefully generated by our heat chambers. So the clean images are obtained from the Coco text dataset. So in total, there are 500 video sequences containing over 1,200 text sequences. So uh, from the results, we can see that the gap between the top three teams are actually fairly large. So we believe that this is an indicator that the research of the atmospheric turbulence mitigation algorithms is not yet saturated. So this is still an open problem for the community to solve. The subtract two uses the coded target data the coded targets encode beat streams into a specific multi-scale patterns. 
the restoration algorithms can be benchmarked by using decoded uh, restoration outputs and compare the results with the ground truth speed values. So the data sets contains four different levels of turbulence and the final bit score is calculated using the average of all 120, uh, 192 test cases. So uh, we would like to thank all the participants and also congratulate the winning teams. Uh, so I will now pass time to Howard. I think Howard is in uh, CPR right now. So he will introduce the third challenge of the trip. Do we have Howard there? Yeah, Howard is here. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Howard, and I'll be going over the, uh, the third challenge track on single image deraining. Uh, so the single image deraining track, the way we define it, is um, taking an image and removing the effects of uh, rain, including streaks and its associated scattering media from images. And so rain in particular is a pretty challenging weather phenomenon because it's actually affected by a bunch of different variables, like your camera parameters, by different atmospheric conditions, even by geographic location, we found. So it manifests itself in images in like a bunch of different ways, like different streak sizes, different droplet sizes and shapes, uh, and also just uh, general veiling effects throughout the scene. Um, so we started this challenge to try to study the rainy weather phenomenon and to spur creative ideas on how to remove this complex weather effect. And so we in order to do this, we use the GT Rain dataset. And I think to understand a little bit more about the motivation behind this challenge, I'll go into a little bit of brief background over this dataset. Uh, so this dataset was published back in ECCV 2022 by my colleagues and I actually, and we published this paper to try to fill a hole in the single image deraining um, community. And so the the general difficulty in single image deraining that is that it's impossible to collect an ideal ground truth for this task. Uh, so what do I mean by ideal ground truth? So if you think about uh, training a fully supervised image to image translation model, uh, what would be the best data to try to do that? It would be, well, two image frames in the exact same instance in time with the same illumination and the exact same scene composition, everything the same except one has rainy weather effects and one doesn't, right? So in our universe, it's impossible to collect data like that. So the way that the community has found to deal with this is to use synthetic rainy weather data. So they take a clean frame and then they add synthetic rain to it. And then now they have their clean and their rainy image frame. So what we found that is that because the rain is such a it's a complex weather phenomenon that can manifest itself in all these different ways. It's actually really difficult for models trained on the synthetic rainy weather to generalize well to real, uh, to real world data. So how do we try to fix this problem? Well, we introduced the concept of time multiplexed ground truth. So time multiplex ground truth means we relax the idea of the ideal ground truth a bit. And we say it doesn't have to be ex the exact same instance in time. We'll relax it to be a few minutes away. So we wait for this magic moment right before the rain stops. And we capture a image both with the rain. And then we wait like maybe around less than 15 minutes and capture a frame without rain. So we actually downloaded thousands and thousands of hours of uh, live stream footage from YouTube and other sources. We use weather APIs to find out if it's raining in that particular geographic location. And we actually manually sifted through all of those uh, hours and waited for the magic moment in each one of these scenes. And we collected a, a pretty big data set um, with uh, rainy, uh, real rainy weather data and its associated time multiplexed ground truth. So as you can imagine, this, uh, this process actually took hundreds and hundreds of man hours. Uh, we actually have a new paper this year at CVPR 2023 titled Weather Stream, um, where we actually automated this process and used like um, light transport principles to create like an automatic pipeline to collect a data set that's six times the size of this and for multiple different weather effects. And we hope that we can extend the challenge next year to multiple weather effects using this new data set. But um, we found that with this GT rain data set, when training models on this data set, it has less of a performance gap as compared to models that train on synthetic data. So keep in mind that this is still not the ideal ground truth. This is time multiplex data. Um, and there are still artifacts because we wait this like 15 minute time interval, but the performance gap is lower than if uh, you train on synthetic data. So 
So that's kind of the motivation that we had behind this challenge. Um, we wanted to uh, spur teams to train and evaluate on real rainy, rainy weather data instead of uh, synthetic weather data. And um, in our challenge, we have a test. Uh, we have a training set. That's the GT Rain training set of twenty six thousand. No, Howard. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're not sharing the slides. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh. That's a classical mistake of me. <laughs> it's my fault. I forgot to share the slides. We should, we should do this first. Okay. I can actually go back and I'll just give like a brief summary. Like, so this is the, the single image deraining task. And then these are some examples from the uh, GT Rain data set. As you can see, we have a bunch of different rainy weather examples. It took a long time to collect this data in a bunch of different geographic locations. And uh, okay, so um, in our challenge track, we have uh, 26,000 paired rainy and clean images for the training set. In our dry run, we have around 5,400 pairs for uh, validation. And uh, for the final test set, 4,500 rainy images uh, for final testing. We had a total of 277 total participants. And uh, we thank all of our participants for taking part in our in our challenge. And the uh, the top three teams uh, performed extremely well. They um, they got PSNRs of up to like twenty six point six three, and uh, they were pretty successful in a lot of the different uh, complex rainy weather conditions, including all the veiling effects. So um, we thank all of the participants, and uh, thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you again. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, as we are looking forward to the uh, 2024, if you guys have any idea, just shoot us an email. We can talk and we can make up more data sets uh, to do things in the wild, whatever you define wild, you know, in this community, wild means a lot of things. So. Uh, send us some ideas. If you think that uh, there's some data set we can create to the community to really uh, stimulate more discussions, uh, we'll be happy to do it. Okay, so let's uh, go to the uh, the invited talk sections. Um, so uh, this is our first section here. Uh, we have uh, two talks, and uh, let me first introduce the uh, our first speaker, uh, Tianfan. Um, so um, Tianfan, would you uh, like to come forward and? Uh, set up a computer. So let me see how I can do it. It might be best. Um, bring it. But then it might be best to use your computer and just. First of all, oh, you can you can plug it in first okay. and just see what happens. So, uh, people on Zoom, give me a few seconds. So oh, I think I will um this um this.
can people here on Zoom uh, hear us? Uh, can you hear us? Yes, 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 we can. Yes, we can. We can hear you. Oh, I see. Do you have a? Can I try again. Um, okay. Uh, can you go to the um, uh, speaker? I mean, uh, so on, on the Zoom panel. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, it's, it's too. Can, can, can people on Zoom uh, try again? Uh, can, you, can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Everything's good. Everything is good. All right. So, uh, I think we'll just monitor if people on Zoom doesn't have a have a problem, just let us know. Okay, great. All right. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Tian Fan. Um, Tian Fan is a graduate uh, of Bill Freeman, um, and then he went to Google. Uh, we're working with um, the Google uh, computational imaging team uh, for a couple of years, and then he recently joined the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He's becoming assistant professor there. Um, and really looking forward to hear his talk on how to make a smart uh, camera a pipeline. Okay, so your turn. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for the introduction. And apologize for really long waiting. And uh, it's my great pleasure to, thanks for Stanley, uh, to uh, invite me here uh, to have this very precious chance to uh, share some of my thoughts on smart camera pipelines. So, uh, I mean, before just a quick background. So uh, before I joined, I was in Google uh, computational photography teams, uh, working with David Salison and Mark Voy uh, on a lot of uh, imaging algorithms running on cell phones. So uh, it got quite, it's very nice experience. Like a lot of industrial experience, how this algorithm works. And then later I also talk a little bit about that, a connection between research and industry. And uh, before I start my talk, just a few uh, works we have done before, just give an idea of the kind of the uh, computational photography we, are interest, we were interested about. Uh, so one is just kind of a nice site, uh, uh, like a, back five years ago, nobody believed that uh, our cell phone can capture images, uh, uh, can capture images of uh, really low light. But nowadays, uh, like uh, most of the, uh, like a uh, flagship phones can capture a uh, low light image. And we were building one of the first uh, algorithm for that. And also we were working on some kind of a real time tone mapping and we made just trying to build some, I'll also talk about that a little bit later, but basically a built in tone mapping algorithm that runs really efficient. Uh, that can run in real time and also integrate into some uh, uh, like a Google's ISP. So, uh, follow the topic of this workshop. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, what is smart cameras. So like uh, many people, when people talking about smart cameras, uh, the first thing they think is that uh, it's basically running some machine learning algorithm, for example, object detection on images, and that sounds smart. Oh, Moreover, people also do some kind of like a, a machine learning based face, uh, like image editing, like face beautification, all this kind of editing stuff. Uh, so basically one simple way to understand smart camera is just applying some machine learning algorithm on images. Again, that's, but however, that might not always be the case. Uh, for example, here's an image uh, where in this uh, arrows, you see nothing, but 
two seconds later, uh, there actually a uh, Viking man uh, jumps out, uh, which actually hidden in the, in the first image, but just too dark to see. And you can imagine any uh, object detection algorithm cannot detect this Viking man in the first place because it's too dark. You just didn't have enough signal for doing that. And this is actually coming from a uh, very badly uh, car crash uh, videos. So this actually kind of uh, suggests us, uh, maybe there's a better way we can design the camera system to get a better signals to start with. So uh, what we're thinking uh, is that, uh, let me see, can, uh, I mean, forgive me, there's a little blocking on the top. Uh, uh, so what we are thinking is that uh, instead of saying we have a camera, capture an image, run some machine learning algorithm, let's try to combine the camera with, uh, with the machine learning algorithm to get a better signal to start with. So this is kind of also aligned with this workshop. We're trying to see what computational photography and detection can do. And uh, so follow the, this kind of design. Uh, first, let's see how normally uh, this kind of smart camera may work. So normally uh, there's a three steps. First, we have these sensors, lenses to capture images uh, from the real world. And normally the image we get is uh, not very good quality. Also, there's a raw space, so it's even not even seeable, uh, perceivable, perceivable. So normally, this kind of a raw image will go through some image processing pipeline uh, on mobile devices. We use uh, ISP uh, image processing uh, 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 image processing chips uh, to do that, or just normal like a software pipeline. So you get nice image. And I mean, myself mostly work on image editing side, uh, image editing side. So I'm here just listing some kind of like editing as a possible one uh, further uh, processing, but also I get people also run like detection, recognition, all this kind of stuff on this image. So basically there's a capturing, processing, editing slash analysis side. So there's three steps. So let's see how machine learning can help in both uh, all these steps. So first on the capturing side, I think the most important one is let's try to capture as much information as possible. No matter what kind of format of this information, as long as we can get more information, this information can be used in later stage. And on the processing and editing side, normally people are trained on machine learning algorithms to, to process the images. And from any learning algorithm, there are two important parts. One is train, where your training data comes from. Um, this is a little bit different from what, uh, oh, sorry, what's your name? Ma, uh, Yun Hao, Yun Hao? Is it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So what he, he, he mentioned, he, he talked about why synthetic data is bad, but today I'll still talk about a little bit about uh, why I think synthetic data still could be useful. And, Later, uh, we'll also talk about uh, the combination, how we design the network itself. And here, we'll, uh, I'll just uh, talk a little bit about how can we combine, I mean, because this kind of a computational photography has been there for many, many years, even before deep learning has come, and how can we design an algorithm, take advantages of some like, like traditional image processing pipelines. Okay, that's very quick an overview. Uh, let's start with some capturing side. So on capturing, uh, let's start a very uh, typical challenge, which is trying to take an image in really low light conditions. And again, because it's too dark, you don't see anything. And can people guess what's there? I mean, I, I cannot tell, first of all, <laughs> but let's see if people can really you know, tell that. <laughs> A little, not, not too far away. It's a, it's a flower, but still, it's a, something on the, on the wall. So, but like, again, same, uh, same ex this is the image captured by exactly the same camera, cameras, no changes for the hardware, but we can capture much nice image and the capture condition is same, it's handheld, no tripod. So that's the 
powerful for field competition of photography. So that's very good point. So uh, actually in this one, the signal is too weak, uh, like mostly just in, in many dark region, it just uh, like a like a noise is mainly dominated. So even you boost the ISO, uh, I mean, you can still see something, but you, it's very noisy. The color is pretty off. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of issues. I, I should show that, that there's a lot of issue just trying to brighten it. And uh, another thing I would like to say is that even not just uh, even more fancier, uh, like say you train machine learning algorithm and take this as input, and it's very hard to generate images like this because it has much more details. So this has to be solved on the capturing side on the very beginning. We need to get more information. Otherwise, machine learning is not like a black magic. You cannot just add all these kind of details. So, so uh, what do we do? Again, uh, the reason uh, normally we have a very low light image like this is very simple. It's just low light and there's not enough functions to start with heating our sensors so the image become dark so if we get just get more photons then the image become brighter very easy physics so what people had done before uh one traditional way to solve it is called exposure bracketing uh, which is basically saying let's capture um, multiple images with different exposure level and trying to fuse it together and this this uh uh, at least the paper from 2007, but I, I, even before that, there's a bunch of we even back to 1990s uh, in this direction. But the one, it's working pretty well for the static scene, but it really comes to reality when there's some dynamics, uh, making robust ghost free is challenging. So in industry, before the simple solution is still, let's say, if we really want to capture low light, we just extend exposure time which is not ideal as well, because you see there's a lot of bad motion blur, which no one would like. So my colleagues in, in Google uh, competition photography teams, we call it GCAM, uh, they propose this very interesting idea called burst photography, which is very similar to exposure bracketing, but, but instead we just capture uh, the same uh, level exposure, uh, but a burst, so all short exposed first image. So because each frame, all the frames are short exposed, uh, it's relatively easier to, uh, to align them and uh, combine them. And also because the, each frame does no motion blur. And also by combining all of them together, we still get enough signals or functions, whatever it costs uh, to get images bright enough. And you basically just get all this frame, trying to align them to correct any, like a because of, is handheld, so there's some mis, uh, misalignment, trying to correct that and combine them together. And this is the result they get. So left is a normal capture, on the right is a, a combination of seven frames. Uh, one thing I should say is that uh, because this is a projector, uh, there's slightly change, but on my screen, uh, it's the difference is, is even larger uh, than this one uh, on the right. But you can see it on the right, there's more details being shown, uh, which on the right is, pretty hazy, a lot of data is missing. And we even push that further uh, to what is called nice sight. It's the same idea. We combine multiple frames, to, multiple frames together, but we make more aggressive in saying that uh, how can we combine this information together? Uh, how can we, uh, like I said, even there's small misalignment, we're try, still trying to accept that. And also we're trying to be more aggressive in exposure setup, uh, use a little bit more longer exposure to make a better trade-off between the uh, uh, motion blur and brightness. And you get this very nice result. So on the left, you see nothing, a uh, normal capture without any exposure bracketing, uh, but on the right, you can see a lot of details of this room. There's pianos, there are bookshelves. So that's basically the power of like saying on a capturing side, if we get more information and with this exposure bracketings, uh, we can actually uh, push the limit of our even this very tiny cell phone sensors uh, to a, like this kind of a comparable to even some, some DSR, some big heavy cameras. So that's one simple example of what I'm saying, uh, what we can do on the capturing side, uh, just get more signals. But there's more we can do, like saying, 
for example, uh, here's one another example is that here's an image, uh, actually a sequence of image where there's very strong reflection of t-shirt and we want to remove that reflection. And again, single image reflection removal is not an easy task, but if we can capture multiple images, then you can see that the reflection has a very different motion with the background. And just utilizing this kind of motion parallax information, you can quite nicely separate them. And this can be even done with just two cameras, uh, sorry, two views, uh, left and right views, and again, uh, it was combined and you can find out where the reflection is. And one reason this kind of two views is interesting because most of cameras, uh, sorry, uh, cell phones these days has at least two cameras, if not three or four or five. Uh, so uh, with that, you just single shot, uh, you can remove the reflection. And this also shows another, uh, this example also shows why this kind of multi source is interesting because if you look like at this, a white dot, uh, actually, it looks like a snowball if you just look at single frame uh, by the snowman. So, one single frame, uh, it's actually a little bit hard to tell whether it's a reflection or not. But for two frames, everyone can tell it's actually from reflection, uh, it's not real. So, this is another source of information. We use additional uh, frames to identify the what is artifacts, what's the signals. And when I say by combining multiple sources, it's not just simple saying we can just combine multiple frames. We can even do more than that. So this is a very old work, uh, like 2000, uh, 2004 uh, by Rick Sigalski. And what they did is that uh, still trying to image in a low light, but they want to reduce flash. But in, most of photographers don't like flash because this image from flash, the color is pretty off. But non-flash images color is great, but it's very noisy. So a simple idea is let's use both and combine them. Again, use computational photography and you get a nice image, nice color, no noise. So just uh, use two sorts of different uh, images, like a flash provides some very nice details, non-flash provides very good color colors. And we just combine different sorts of information to get what, what we want. Similar, similar ideas, we can also apply this to uh, IR image, uh, because if people have used some surveillance camera for babies, I have one at my home, is that at a very low light, even in the room, I cannot see anything. If I open this IR camera, so I can see my babies uh, lying on bed, very cute. So I have a camera with the IR flash is very powerful and capture signals in low light. But again, the color is not right and combine this RGB noisy image. You can get a clean image, but with correct colors. So- Are you looking for a band that? Uh, sorry? Looking for a band Oh, this is, uh, this, uh, what is it called? Uh, the, the near infrared, not like the, the one we used to measure temperature. Uh, that one is very expensive and also didn't have this much resolution. I mean, the, the thing I didn't mention, I just showed in slides, this is a very strong IR flash, otherwise, uh, even this one, you don't see any too much. So, but the, the, the good thing for IR flash is just nobody's, uh, nobody realizes you are actually in flashing. Mm -hmm. So that's another way we can combine source of information uh, by different, uh, different types of sensors. And even more, there's right now, a lot of people talking about event cameras for its ability to capture really fast moving objects. Uh, I, I mean, I think in this workshop, I don't need to explain what event camera is. And like for me, I'm this this for me, I'm mostly interested in like a imaging, uh, like a uh, generate better images and videos. And this is one work by David Sacramento um, from the University University of Zurich. And what they did, and actually a bunch of work in this direction also did that. Uh, is that saying we have a very normally uh, normal uh, like a slow sorry a low frame rate videos RGB because most of the cameras can only support like I say 30 fps or 60 fps, but combine that with event camera which can capture really high frame rate uh, frame rate motions we can synthesize quite a realistic uh, slow motion videos like this fair and if people working on framing templates you may know that. 
if you're trying to do just two frame interpolation for this kind of uh, fireplace, it's really challenging because of there's it's, fire has this very irregular motion. You, know, you really have to capture those signal in order to, to interpolate. And event camera helps us. So, but again, if you just show this to people, people even don't know what it is. So it's just combining, it's another example of trying to combine different sources uh, to get a mirror of both. So that's one part on the capturing side. So this is just a few examples. I think there's in this community, there's a lot more works on that. And I think that I believe that for many tasks, uh, we can be really creative in designing our cameras using different cameras, different sensors, different capturing strategies try to get as much more information possible. And the machine learning algorithm and the computation and photography algorithm is really powerful to combine this information together. So that's one part I think is useful for building smart cameras. And now let's come to the really algorithm part is that how can we design and processing and editing algorithms to treat all this data we get. So let's first talk about training data. So typically, uh, when people say, let's train a machine learning algorithm for image processing, it's like this. Very simple, you get one image as input, throw that to some networks. There are a lot of a very good network, a UNAT, a transformer, stuff like that, and then you get output. And so to do that, one of the challenges is that actually how to create, get this ground truth uh, pair, like a noise, for example, for denoising, you have noisy image as input, and the noise output. Now also the raining, as uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you need to have a rain, a raining image as input and the rain image as output. Now, how can we get these pairs? So if you talk to the, like say some kind of like a, like a, like a normal object detection recognition guys, they say, they will say, okay, that's easy. Let's label it. And uh, say, uh, for example, object detection, you just get this and, uh, bunch of bounding box and ask some people to help you to label it. And very experienced labelers can do this labeling just in a few seconds for image. And this is how ImgeNet and the Coke, MS Coke and all this data are being created. And there's a, uh, like there's a millions of labeled images uh, generated in this way. However, if to come to the computational photography, things be becomes much more challenging. For example, if I ask a photographer, let's try to label or denoise this image. What they will do is that, okay, let's find each patch, uh, tune different the denoising parameters, find the best one and move to the next patch. Uh, I actually see one of the photographers doing that way. It takes like several hours just even for one image. And that's even not what he thinks is enough. So this doesn't work out. If you're really trying to say, let's, like a millions of image. Another solution is say, let's try to design some good capturing strategy to get to a pair. Uh, for example, for denoising, one simple trick is this, let's just capture really long exposure time. Uh, so it's not little, no noise. Or like the raining cases, we just capture one image of and one image of result ring. And, but uh, I think since you have done that before, you know that doing that is really time consuming. Uh, like for example, if you really bring the cameras to go out to capture some images, uh, normally we can capture about like I say, 100 pairs per day. I mean, also depends on task, but you can not actually capture a lot. So that's not a comparable to say the median images on the like say for ImgeNet. So that's still not an easy task, but it's doable, at least trackable. But moreover, to make things even more complicated is because there are so many uh, cameras manufacturers, which is a good thing for the community. But the bad thing for the community is that they just breach so many cameras, uh, so many sensors, so many lenses. And if you come to the denoising and all these kind of tasks, uh, the, uh, the lens design, sensor design may just affect statistics. statistics. And one model trained for one specific cam camera module may not generalize. And you cannot say, let's collect each data set for each one of the camera module, at least like a, a list of about thousands there. That's not tractable. So the idea could be is that on the internet, we have uh, this, uh, uh, this is actually old statistics, 
uh, three trillion images per day being uploaded. Uh, can we just try to utilize that? I mean, that's how people build uh, like all this kind of image and I don't know, this kind of uh, data set instead of collecting by ourselves. So that's why I think synthetic is still kind of interesting idea. And so what we did, uh, what, what people can do and is that you get a clean image, you apply some degenerations, either raining, haze, or noise, whatever. And then you create this kind of a clean and the degenerate image pairs. And then you can use that as the ground truth and train your network. Oh, down. Simple, easy, but not really. The challenge here is becomes how can we generate this realistic degeneration? And I think that's a very interesting topic, also challenging topics in this area. So I just below follow up, follow up. I just show a few effort in this direction. And again, this is just also for for just to give people some ideas or trying to uh, raise some discussion in this part. That's this is still very uh, open ended questions. So. Here, I just give one example. I still use denoising uh, as an example. For denoising, actually, it's relatively easy because uh, these days there's a very good noise model for sensors called a uh, uh, Gaussian Poisson noise, or some people call it noise and Shaw noise, uh, which has a very nice model. The only issue is that this model only works for what people call raw frames, or that's what sensors directly get. However, when we say we capture an image with our, like say iPhones, uh, the images uh, normally look like that, which is really nice, but actually goes through a very complicated camera pipelines. And these days, because all these uh, camera manufacturers want to make an image better, this pipeline actually becomes uh, more and more uh, complicated. So it, you can imagine that even you have a very nice models here, you cannot just transfer them. So that's, a, that's an issue. Uh, we need to still want to model this, the, this noise here. So here's one work we have done before, uh, a trick trying to close the gap, which is since we have very complicated camera pipeline, let's try to revert that. Say when we get an RGB image, uh, we just invert tone mapping, invert gamma, invert color correction, and apply mosaic patterns. And then we get what we call kind of a studio raw frames. And since it's in raw space, then we can add noise and go back this direction again, apply mosaic, color correction, gamma correction, and tone mapping. And this, by doing so, we can get a bit more realistic noise model, the uh, no noisy and the clean image pair. One thing you may argue is that this is not correct because camera pipeline is so complicated. It's not just these four steps and some of them even not invertible. There's you need more information to do that. And that's completely true. No one can actually invert a camera pipeline. But what we argue is that this at least brings us one step closer to the reality. And this even just one step closer, you, we actually see this bring us some improvement in denoising quality. Again, if people can think about even better idea, how can we do that? Uh, we will get even better performance. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of people can be really creative in how can we generate all this synthetic data to try to list. I, I, I don't think we can really just uh, just uh, just completely uh, like a close the gap, but just even one further, make it further uh, closer. It will really just make a big impact to the final image quality. So that's for denoising. Also raindrops. Uh, there's tons of work on the raining and part of it is trying to design the algorithm, but also a lot of works also trying to do uh, how can we just synthesize a nice uh, raining, uh, less, nice raining patterns uh, to train the network. Uh, this is a work by uh, Jia Ying Liu uh, from the Peking University. And uh, what it, I mean, this is just one sample of that work. There's a lot of work on that. What they did there uh, is that uh, they analyze uh, like a different type of rings, like say heavy rings have this kind of different patterns. And normally some of the rings have uh, like a ring accumulation, like a, just different layers. And they try to make a better simulation uh, about how real realistic ring should be. And it turns out it can just improve the performance of the algorithm on real images. 
So any improvement on simulation, what I'm trying to show here is that any improvement on simulation side about how the realistic degenerate should be can help us to improve the quality. And also I just, this is the work <laughs> being shown before, also use this kind of semi-ground truth uh, way to collect a real realistic training data. And I'm also thinking whether there's a better way to combine the synthetic and real uh, to make it, uh, sorry, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Um, okay, uh, let's skip this one, uh, which is uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, we can also just directly use rendering engines uh, to render some realistic, uh, uh, realistic frames. And I'll skip this one, this is uh, for flare removal. But again, uh, you have a better simulation engine, you can do better work. Okay, uh, at last, uh, which comes to the, uh, pre uh, the processing part. And so, as I mentioned, from the processing part, I think the interesting one is that there's a lot of uh, image processing algorithms, uh, traditional processing algorithms, and how can we combine that with networks? So one simple processing, uh, very widely used, is called 3D large. Uh, which is basically saying if you have a point to RGB to RGB mapping, you can just record in this 3D space, uh, which RGB maps to what RGB map values. And this is very widely used, you say, in Lightroom or image processing pipeline. So based on that, this is one of the work by uh, Professor uh, Lei Zhang. Um, what they did is that in order to make the image processing pipeline efficient, instead of directly saying we want to make enhance this image, they train a CNN, take this image and input and output uh, image. What they did is they say, let's train a CNN weight predictor, uh, which output a bunch of weights. And this weights combines a bunch of basic 3D large to generate like a, uh, like a per image adaptive 3D large and apply that to this image. So the network only applied generated this 3D large. And because of, because of that, it becomes way more efficient than say a fully convolutional network when trying to process an image. Uh, this is like a like this 10x faster. We, we also have done similar idea when we're trying to do some stylization. Say you have a star image, and if you just train a network to stylize it, uh, it we are running out of memory. Uh, uh, you even go to like a four megapixel image. So what we did is that we try to also approximate this kind of style through a tone curves. But if you just sort of apply the through one global tone curve, you'll find that there's no single one-to-one -one mapping from input to output intensities. But if you zoom in to some small patches, like say uh, here some uh, blue and red patches, and if for each patch, you'll find that the mapping from input to output is more linear. And uh, based on this kind of idea, you can approximate the mapping from input to output by a bunch of uh, this kind of uh, uh, local curves like this. And I won't go through details, but these curves actually can be represented by what is called bilateral bridge. And then you can train a network to predict this bilateral bridge, which is a bunch of curves only running in very low resolution, and then apply on the full resolution image and to get the output. And a good thing for that is that, again, all network only runs on low resolution. It's really efficient, only five milliseconds on even a four, like a, a 12 megapixel image. Like this one, we stylize it like this, just five milliseconds, really efficient. And you get a better, you can preserve all the details. And that's also the marriage, like say, when we combine the traditional image processing with neural networks. And this is also integrating Google TensorChip. Um, I'll skip this one. This, we also applied, tried a similar trick uh, for denoising, also using some local patches to approximate a denoising operation. And if people are interested, that's uh, in our uh, last year ECCB paper. And also, again, because this combination becomes more efficient. And 
uh, since we are running out of time, I'll just quickly flash some of my thoughts on the future, future directions. Uh, one thing is that uh, I think simulation is really, really cool. Uh, this is from Tesla AI Day. Uh, they simulate different artifacts uh, in their training pipelines. So I think simulation is probably really powerful for this community. And another thing is that I think there's a lot of opportunity combination between the computational photography and hardware. And this is one of the very uh, the, uh, the popular uh, works in this days called nano lens, which people design a really thin lens, just even smaller than fingertips. And they combine that with some computational photographies uh, to generate a nice image even out of that. I mean, the direct capture images from this kind of a small lens is not great, but combined with some computational photography, you get very nice results. And also uh, like an AIGC, uh, like people use a lot of generated content these days and how that can combine uh, with the computational photographies. And one thing is that uh, the boundary between what we were called editing and synthesis, it become blurry these days. For example, this one, a uh, little bit hard to tell which one's real, which one's fake. Uh, you stare a while, maybe I think, okay, this is a, this is a real faked one, but how about this? Uh, this is all generated images, which looks really nice. Uh, and even this one, this is by a very popular software called Midjourney, uh, which is really professional. So how can we define the boundary between synthesis and editing? Um, okay, I'll skip this part. And that's all the collaborator I have, and I'll take questions from here. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for your nice presentation. Uh, I'm still an undergraduate student, so I'd like to ask some questions about it. Uh, I found that you have worked a lot on image processing and camera, all those things. And uh, I have found uh, maybe for us, we have improved the image quality. So I'd like to ask whether you have um, used like some human vision driven um, image quality assessment, expect those SSIM or uh, PSNR. I'd like to ask because actually whether an image is good or not mainly depends on our uh, audience decision, decision, right? Yes, that's a very good question. That's exactly the, the slides I skipped. <laughs> so I thanks you give me a chance to present that. <laughs> so yes, uh, metrics is really important. It's very hard. Uh, for example, a lot of people use PSNR, but you can see that PSNR actually doesn't tell the visual difference. So this is by QKIP upsampling. And this is what's a very famous uh, super resolution algorithm called SRGAN. No one, I think everyone should be, would say this is better. But if you look at PSNR, this is actually lower than by cubic. So like a single metric sometimes doesn't tell us uh, what is best. I mean, there's more like people, there's more perceptual metrics like LPIPs and stuff like that. But even more challenging problem is that if for single image, people may have different preferences. For example, all these three images are edited by professional photographers but has very different colors, contrast, brightness. For single image, just people have really different uh, preferences. It's very challenging, but also an opportunity for research how to model these user preferences. No solution yet. We are come to contribute. Hey, Jingwei, are you here? Yes. 
Hello. Okay. Great. Um, so let's go to our second talk uh, by Jingwei Gu. So Jingwei is um, uh, currently a associate professor in Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, he was uh, with Sense Time, am I right? Sense Time for a couple of years. Yeah, and I also know I know, I know Jingwei through uh, transactions on computational imaging, where he's a associate editor. Um, and I, if I remember, Jingwei, you graduated from Columbia. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, is it with uh, Sri Naya? Yes. Mm. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so so Jingwei is gonna talk more about this computational photography on mobile devices. Uh, and his talk is uh, some work on AI power mobile uh, computational photography, okay? So uh, Jingwei, I will just give um, the time, the stage to you. And okay. um, uh, I think we, we will um, get it done and, uh, at uh, 10, 15, is it okay? 10, 15? 10, 15, okay. 10, 15, our time, yep, yep, okay. okay. Can you see the slides, okay? Uh, yes, you can see the slide. The, the, the full screen, not the notes, right? The slide, you can see uh, this. This is the full screen, yes, that's correct. Okay, all right, uh, thanks for the introduction. I think I have about 30 minutes. Um, yeah, I will go a little bit quick. Um, okay, um, it uh, is my great pleasure to, to come here to uh, give some update of our recent work on AI-powered mobile computational photography. And as Stanley said, I have uh, worked in both academia and uh, industry. So just like uh, what Tian Van did, uh, I, I will talk more about uh, the, some excite, uh, exciting uh, advance in uh, computational photography on mobile phones. Now, first, uh, as you can, as you we all know, nowadays um, we we use mobile phones to take pictures. Uh, a lot of uh, and then there's a lot of computational photography algorithms actually running behind that. When we press a button, um, there's a traditional image processing method as well as a lot of AI-based uh, processing methods, such as HDR, where we need to combine multiple shots to handle ghosting. Uh, when we take pictures and uh, low light situations, there's a, a lot of denoising tone mapping uh, operators behind that, and, that's, and also for bouquet and the motion. And nowadays, um, um, if you look at the number of uh, pictures taken by different type of cameras, um, the uh, cell phone uh, photography is actually dominate. So this is a picture. Uh, this is a little bit, a couple of years old dated data from uh, until I think 2016. And I really like the animation that Michael Brown did before. So if you uh, actually show the plot, the yellow, the the orange bar actually shows the, you know, the percentage of the. Let me play this one more time. You know, the percentage of photos taken by cell phone. So I would say uh, mobile phone is really the most uh, suitable. Uh, area to test and to develop computational photography algorithms nowadays, um, because it's going to be used by hundreds of millions of users almost every day. Now, and the AI-based uh, computational method has been, computational photography method has been used uh, in many phones, almost every phone. Here are some examples, for example, in uh, the Mate 40, um, they have this so-called AI mode, and it's, as you can see, it can recover the details, uh, increase the resolution. In Xiaomi's phone here, and they have the um, night video software from Blinken AI. Uh, I worked previously in SenseBrain and also Tetris AI, which are uh, sort of uh, child companies uh, of Sense time. And we develop algorithms and has been used in many cell phone, uh, cell phones. So on the high level, I think this so-called of AI Power the computational photography has three levels. The first level is we uh, develop algorithm to deal with these novel sensors and novel hardware, as well as uh, the in the uh, software part. Um, to first uh, for the novel new sensor, we need to develop algorithm to convert that to standard bare format uh, and so on. The second level is so-called uh, the AISP, where we do end-to-end -end system optimization um, to uh, to 
uh, design the optimal system to process images. And finally, the AI-driven imaging, where we develop novel imaging systems to capture not only images, but uh, is, uh, informative features, and then use AI decoding, the novel uh, ASP, ISP systems to decode uh, the features, either for viewing purpose or for some detection recognition and high-level high uh, computer vision tasks. So today I'm going to talk about four different, uh, some results we uh, did uh, for uh, four different uh, aspects in computational photography. One is to uh, deal with new hardware. Second is about data. So Tianfan mentioned about the importance of the data. I, I'm sure you all know the challenge is uh, for data acquisition for low level tasks. We are going to talk about a little bit about that. And then uh, two other things. One is the controllability. The other is related to generative AI, how that can be used uh, for computational photography. So first uh, for the new uh, hardwares. So uh, in uh, my work in SenseBrain has been developing this hardware and software system solution to improve image and the video qualities. And as you, as you probably it's a little bit surprising actually, nowadays for mobile phones, more than 70% of sensors are not bare sensor. They're, they're either this so-called a core sensor or ISO cell, which is two by two or three by three or four by four, where you can do binning or you can do this kind of a rearrangement called a remosaic to convert that to uh, bear patterns. Um, and, uh, or this two by two OCR where you share a micro lens uh, for a group of pixels for the focusing purpose and so on. And uh, there are other color filter uh, patterns such as IYYB, RGBW, and RGBIR. So there's, uh, and also top sensors, organic sensors, and uh, event uh, sensors and so on. These are all being used or already being used or and going to be used soon for different mobile sensors. And then also a, no, a lot of novel hardware in, in optics, such as on the display cameras, uh, compact uh, camera modules, soft lens and so on. And there's also uh, innovation in the ISP system as well. So uh, I'm going to talk about in, today, I'm going to talk about some work we did at the uh, sensor part, which we call AI sensor front end. So we developed a, a very uh, light, uh, lightweight AI system. It's hardware friendly to process raw data, and it support many different uh, uh, novel sensor patterns, such as uh, the core sensor two by two OCL and uh, this uh, RGB CMY. And then the purpose of that is we want to develop a system to convert this uh, to generate a high quality raw bare bare data for the uh, commodity ISP systems. So for example, we need to do this rearrangement we call remosaic or uh, deal with the color issues, remove the moray artifact, uh, combine multiple exposures to generate a better HDR, remove the motion blur to generate, basically generate better bare patterns. And uh, the challenge is it has to be very fast, interpretable, learnable and uh, need to take into account the information uh, for uh, image formation model. So here are some examples where you can see the regular remote. Uh, if you don't do it correctly, it will create uh, artifact. Here is the AI remote. So let's take the, a closer look at the so-called AI remote. So if you give this pattern uh, of cord or RGB white, uh, you want the remote just like a demo mosaic, but uh, instead, we want to convert into a Bayer pattern. Now, why this is difficult? Well, it's because if um, this is a first, it's the first step in the ISP pipeline. So if there's any artifact in this step, it's going to be um, exaggerated and amplified over, over the, you know, the pipeline. It's well, even a small uh, dot uh, in the arrow, it will become a big blob in the final image. And then also there's many different types of uh, color filter rays, a uh, different lens specific, micro lens specification, PDF variation. So if you combine all this, you will have many different types of sensors. So you don't want to develop one set of method for each, the, each of the sensors. You want to have one unified method for all of them. And uh, the computational budget is very uh, uh, limited because it's, most likely will be done in real time or even faster than real time 60 frames per second to handle a very large 
uh, field view, a uh, large uh, uh, number of pixels, and also there's uh, sensor calibration and the controllability uh, challenges. So here are some examples where you can see the traditional rule-based remosaic method will create a lot of artifacts such as jagged effect, warm uh, noise, blur, the purple fringe, and so on. So uh, take one example, the two by two OCR uh, sensor. This is uh, developed by Sony, uh, first uh, uh, on the market by December, 2019. And uh, it's basically have one micro lens uh, shared by four pixels. The benefit, uh, on just uh, similar to the dual pixel uh, sensors is, but it has X and, uh, and Y both access uh, focus capability. However, uh, it has two major issues. One is the sensitivity difference. So within each of the four uh, sub pixels, they may have different sensi uh, sensitivity and phase because the, the center of the micro lens may shift, may not be exactly at the center. So if you do um, the remosaic uh, using the traditional method, you will have this, it's create a small micro uh, light field. And that's actually create a lot of artifact. Uh, it could be a benefit, but here we, we, we talk about the, the artifact caused by phase difference and sensitivity. So um, we develop a very uh, lightweight uh, AI deep learning method, uh, basically uh, to, to solve this problem. Uh, and uh, um, the, there's a lot of uh, challenges here. I, I want to mention one thing, in addition to the ones that I mentioned before, another challenge is, um, in real product, you not only the image has to be good, but also the uh, the noise st uh, statistics and the black levels has to be exactly the same as the regular Bayer sensor because it's going to be, uh, otherwise it's going to affect the later uh, process. Like if you burst the photography, if you want to combine multiple frames. So it's that part, the sort of the first order and the second order uh, requirement of the uh, image Remosaic is make make this even more challenging. So here are some examples that uh, our method can uh, achieve um, uh, compared to the regular the uh, whatever is in the uh, hardware the uh, previous Sony method and uh, on the right is our method um, and. Uh, the same uh, methodology can also be used for different other types of. Uh, uh, color filter array sensors such as RGB white. So here compared with the regular RGB sensors, the RGB white sensors after remosaic shows uh, both the benefit in SNR and dynamic range, but also has a less more because it has uh, a higher spatial resolution and uh, more details. Um, and actually uh, many of these uh, AI sort of so-called AI sensor has been already commercialized so we developed the first AI uh, RGB white sensors has been used in Vivo's X80 flagship phone. Uh, and uh, we also uh, developed this uh, remote on two by two by four sensors, which is the world first 200 mac uh, pixel sensors. Uh, it's going to be launched, uh, I think by the end of this year on a, a flagship phone. And there's many other sensors that we, we were having working on such as RGB CMY, uh, RGB EVS, RGB combined with event sensor, RGB combined with spot top sensors, and so on. So um, now, uh, since this work uh, are already in commercialized product, I cannot talk too much about technical uh, uh, details here. Um, um, but I want to say that we actually organized a MIPI workshop uh, last year in CECC event, this year in CVPR. On this website, you can find some of the data set, benchmark, and uh, reports on this kind of method on novel image sensors and the camera systems. Uh, you can test, uh, test out. Okay, so the next thing is uh, the data. <clears throat> now, uh, I want to use the under display camera as an example. So this is a uh, a uh, very desired feature actually for uh, for cell phones and also for other uh, mobile devices with a display because we don't want um, if we if possible we want to remove the sort of the the small hole uh, on the screen on the one hand you can have a better uh, you know a larger screen but also um, uh, for example for laptop and the TVs you can put the camera right in the center of the uh, display so that you don't have to adjust the perspective and so on. 
So the idea is, so actually there are already some commercialized uh, phones on the display cameras, right? So the idea is to uh, reduce the density of the, uh, the OLED display a little bit such that you will let the light come through. Now, um, the, the, the challenge is because the density is still very high uh, in order you know, for not visible to human eyes, um, the, when the light comes through, it will have the diffraction artifact. So that will cause a very strong flare and we need to get rid of that. So here are some exam, uh, uh, challenges, image quality challenges. So not only in addition to the lens flare, which is very uh, you know, bad here, and there's also high dynamic, the dynamic range issue, uh, color tint, uh, noise, because only a part, a, par, a part of the light comes through, haze and so on. So how to deal with that? Now, um, in order to solve this problem, we want to use deep learning and in order to use deep learning, we need to have data. And uh, so we look at this problem and uh, you can see that regular UDC images and uh, a clean image, and there's a very you know, different, especially this kind of flare patterns. So here we look at the PSF re of regular cameras and, uh, and on the display cameras, because we, we model the aperture function of the uh, display, given the sort of the display pattern, we can calculate the PSF and this has this long tail and different patterns. Now. The first, uh, you know, the first idea we want to do is we want to simulate images, as as Tim has said, using simulation. And uh, there's a previous work on on this one uh, in ECCB 2020. They, they did a very good job. Now, however, if you look at their synthesized data compared to the real UDC data, they didn't capture sort of the the long tail, uh, the flare artifact. And the reason for that is because we need to use that high dynamic range things because many of the long tails is caused by the uh, dynamic range, the, the very uh, strong light source. And there are also, um, so here uh, you can see the difference between the simulated with low dynamic range and high dynamic range. So the first work we did in 2021 is very simple. We model the entire image formation pipeline uh, of the under display camera. So uh, we measure the PSF or the uh, and the, or synthesize the PSF of given display pattern, and the given HDR scene, uh, we can simulate the, the total uh, the, the image formation uh, pipeline and the generated simulated data. And then we use this one and uh, propose the network to solve the problem. And in this case, we can do. Uh, 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 quite better compared to the previous method. So this is on the synthetic data. And we use, we actually ported this method on the real phone, the ZTE-A20 UTC phone. So you can see it can remove the artifact, but also um, it doesn't degrade the, the, doesn't sort of blur the detail of the face, which is very important. So uh, like the, the hair and also the, the facial detail is not blurred away. Here is another example we sort of, uh, showing uh, we keep the preserve the detail of the facial uh, facial appearance and remove the flare. But however, if uh, there's still some remaining artifact, the reason for that is um, it, first, if you look at the synthetic UDC versus the real uh, UDC images, uh, the there's there's still quite a different uh, uh, quite a large gap between this uh, two type of images. And then there's a lot of reason. One is when we measure the PSF or model the uh, aperture function of the display, there's always errors and inaccuracy. And also uh, the PSF formation is a simplification of the real uh, light interaction within the, on the display system. There's also inter-reflection, diffraction, and the refraction within the camera systems. Also the camera ISP is also a simplification. So to deal with that, we really want to use um, what we really want is we want to capture real data. We want to use one uh, on display camera and one regular camera, normal camera, and capture pair data. And I, I'm sure you all know this for any other low level vision tasks such as super resolution or deraining, we wish to have you know, real paired data. However, uh, in this case, uh, we find even if you put these two cameras very close together, there's still alignment issue, right? Both the geometric alignment and the photometric alignment. And how to deal with that? 
So uh, here, you, you, when we align these two images, uh, overlay the UDC and the reference images together, you can see both the uh, misalignment in terms of the, the color and also the, the geometric things. So in this, um, this year, CVPR, we have a, a paper called Align form, uh, Former. We use a, a transformer to deal with that. So this idea uh, is very simple. We have two parts. First, we, we use a, a live former to generate this so-called pseudo ground truth data. And then uh, we use a, a resolution a, a restoration net to, um, to, to train on the pseudo sort of uh, training data to generate the clean image. Um, and uh, the live former uh, have uh, basically two parts. One is the so-called uh, domain alignment module, the DAM, which basically handle the photometric uh, misalignment. And the second is the GAM, which handle the geometric alignment. So the DOM is basically inspired by the recent success of uh, style GAN. So we propose a similar design uh, in, it include a guidance uh, net to generate a guidance vector and a matching net to modulate the features given the conditional vector. Um, the GAM, the geometric alignment module, um, again, here the key idea is we change the attention, the self attention module a little bit. So instead of sampling at the same location, we we'll calculate optical flow between the reference and the UDC uh, image and uh, uh, instead of calculate the uh, uh, sampling around the same location, we sample around after uh, you know the shift by the uh, optical flow. So by doing this, uh, we basically can handle the geometric alignment uh, um, explicitly. And finally, we're training using a loss function called a context loss. So context loss basically regard the features of images as a set. So therefore, it can tolerate to some degree the misalignment, the slight misalignment. Again, the code and data is available here. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, although in this paper, we use this method for the, uh, for the uh, UDC, it can also be used for other low-level vision tasks. So here is some example. So compared with uh, our previous work using synthetic data, you can see that it can, does not have the artifact around the uh, edges and so on. And uh, even compared with using real data and uh, the context loss, we also have better result. So here is compared with other uh, method. And here, I think it's a zooming uh, to show we can get rid of this uh, uh, flares uh, around the, uh, the, the corners and so on. And here is another example. So the third thing I want to talk about is control. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> um, so controllability is really critical for mobile computational photography if you want um, you know, this to be in the final product uh, because there's a lot of ISP tuning engineers and each cell phone company, they, different users have different preference. Um, we really want to have a very easy um, user interface to tune based on the user, such as like a, Adobe Photoshop, right? You want to have a slider that you can, you can adjust this. And, uh, one reason for that is we know for image restoration task, there's this fundamental trade-off between the percep perception quality and the distortion, right? You can either make it more sharp, but maybe with fake textures or make it, the PSNR looks better, uh, but it will smooth out the details, right? So this is a, a chart we copied from uh, this paper, this seminal work. Now, um, can we actually do a transverse between this this sort of trade trade uh, trade off uh, for deep learning uh, models, and uh, we know to do this trade off for traditional image processing methods such as uh, bilateral filter, for example, is very simple. They have very intuitive parameters. You can tune it; it's very fast. But for neural network, it's a challenge. Um, there's actually very few work in this domain. The the real time uh, tuning. We find some work uh, basically have the interpolation math based and the conditional. Uh, condition uh, network based. For both of this method, you need an actual network to tune basically the latent feature, the features rather than the, so, so, so the tuning is not that intuitive and also uh, it's time consuming. Every time you tune a, a parameter, you have to do a one forward pass and that's, that's uh, not desirable. And finally, uh, for 
getting this uh, training actual network, you need to train uh, the multiple at multiple stages. So in, in uh, this year, we had a work uh, called uh, real-time controllable denoising imaging. So instead of uh, doing add additional control net, uh, network in the middle, uh, we actually proposed a method to directly edit the noise at the output. Uh, so the idea is very simple. It has three components. The first is the backbone denoise network. Now, instead of output a clean image, we output multiple uh, noise images at different levels. And then the key part is we have this noise decorrelation module, which we de decorrelate this noise. Later on, uh, uh, you can sort of linearly combine this noise together at different strengths. So this, this controllability is given to the user. You can manually control them, or we have auto-tune module to learn the optimal way to combine them. Once you combine the noise, uh, then you can combine with the input image to generate the clean image. So um, why we need to do the correlation, decorrelation? Because if we don't do it, you can see if you combine them, it's that the, it doesn't uh, make sense, right? To mix 20 and 40 is actually get something correspond to uh, the noise level 12. So we, we use the uh, uh, idea of uh, batch whitening method to decorrelate the features, uh, decorrelate the noise so that you can combine them linearly later on. And this is our training loss. And uh, so in, in the end, uh, we our methods editing is very fast. So compared to with this two um, hours the editing only, uh, we, we don't have to go through the uh, forward pass every time you edit because it can be added at the, at the output stage. Therefore, it enables the video noise, uh, the tuning for video denoising method. And also the denoise result is good uh, uh, compared with other method and also it is flexible. So this module can be um, can be plugged into any denoising modules uh, and also suitable to tune the, de the video denoising. So here is a, uh, a video to show the um, what we can have. So, um, so you, you basically have a sliding bar to, to adjust the, the denoise strength rather than every time you have to train uh, a different neural network for different user preference and so on. Um, so here is for the for the video denoise uh, uh, tuning of video denoise method. Okay, so lastly, let me talk a, a little bit about generative AI. So everybody uh, in uh, this workshop, I think that you are most familiar with this formulation, right? So for every image restoration task, it can formulate it as a data term, uh, where is the AX minus B, B is the measurement, and uh, the regularization term. So the regularization term has a lot of uh, forms such as smoothly, sparsity, total variation, and recently about the adversary loss and generative priors. Now on the left side, we call this is the signal reconstruction part. So we want to take the measurement uh, as much as we can. And uh, there's always a bound by Nyquist sampling uh, rate. And on the right hand, the least regularization term help us to get better result. Now, recently, generative AI becomes more and more powerful. And uh, I think given uh, a stronger and stronger generative, uh, generative AI priors, the signal reconstruction problem actually becomes an information retrieval problem. That means our sample can be weak. Uh, for example, if you have a very limited budget or bandwidth, um, and uh, we can use a stronger prior to generate to, to, to generate more uh, reasonable results. So we have some work in this domain. So I collaborate with uh, Professor uh, Trenton Loy in NTU. We, we had a work uh, in 2021 called Galing, where you can generate a, a very large uh, resolution image from very low resolution input. So as I showed here, and here is another example. So the idea in this case, using the uh, generative prior is very, very straightforward. So we combined with the supervised uh, encoding decoding network with the uh, pre-trained uh, GAN generator. So we copy, directly copy from the style GAN um, two and the copy the, their, their filters that learned into this, uh, um, uh, 
uh, filter into this structure. So we fix the uh, frozen uh, filters and then we train the encoder and decoder. And just by doing that, it can generate much better result, uh, both keep the fidelity of the images and also generate more detail. So here we compared with other supervised encoder decoder method as well as other gain inversion method. Uh, and here is another uh, other examples. Now on this uh, thread, we recently also have look at other generative priors. So this is two uh, seminal work, one is uh, called Codeformer and the other is FEMA, uh, FEMA SR. And both uh, of them using Codebook to do uh, face super resolution or the, generative, uh, the general image super resolution. However, um, the problem, they, they have very good results. The problem is when you actually look at uh, images that are not within the training data set, um, they, can, they turns out to destroy the structure a little bit, right? So for example, here, and also here the, the texture on the bricks and also especially the face. And uh, um, we want to solve that problem. And the idea is also very simple. So instead of using a single code book, which corresponds to one partition in the latent space, we want to use multiple code book. So because there's different types of textures, for example, natural things or man-made object, indoor things, architectures, and so on. So we propose multiple different code books, each of that correspond to one type of appearance and uh, correspond to one partition in the latent space. And then the latent uh, variable will be a weighted combination uh, of these different bases, code book bases. So the training basically have two stages. One is we train, learn the code book bases and learn the weights. And then for the downstream image restoration task, we, um, we basically find the optimal way to combine them to generate the final image. So here is, uh, we, we have five categories, some of the, uh, uh, the codes that we learned, and uh, here is the visualization of the weight for this image. And uh, here, as you can see for com com uh, reconstruction hours called ADA code has better result, better preserve the texture. And here for the super resolution task, ours also shows better result. And for in painting method, uh, ours also generate uh, more realistic images. And uh, I have three more slides. I will finish quickly, sorry, to the two minutes late. So we also have some recent work uh, using latent diffusion uh, for image restoration uh, for mobile phones. So I want to show you some of the result. Uh, as you can see, I don't know whether it's, it's visible there uh, if you far away. So here I want to show from the input noise and blur image, we can reconstruct even the hair details here. Uh, traditional uh, or uh, many previous work, you know, for this very high frequency uh, uh, textures, it will blur out. But using this method, uh, latent diffusion, it actually can recover that, also recover the eyelashes and some textures within the, uh, uh, the iris. So this is very powerful. Generative AI, I believe, is going to be used uh, uh, very widely in the mobile phones very soon. So what's next? I think one of that is uh, we we want to combine the novel imaging hardware and the generative AI models to even to achieve even better image qualities under many of these challenging conditions, such as the extreme low light, high speed, uh, very high dynamic range, and low visibilities. Here. Um, you know, uh, uh, we, we know uh, from the Google Pixel, they have done seminar work on the burst of photography that's really improved the image quality on mobile phones. But there's a, there's a trade-off. It can either handle very bright things with fast motion or very uh, uh, low light things with slow motion. Now with generative AI and the computational imaging, I think we can even push this frontier better. Uh, and finally, last slide, I want to say uh, a few words about from academia research to industry product. So I think we are already established that deep learning and AI is magical and cool. However, if you want to make it in the final product, if you, especially if you want people to pay for it, it has to satisfy stable, uh, it has to be stable, efficient, robust, especially controllable and interpretable. And I think, I, I hope there will be more and more work in this domain. So especially for the controllability, um, that's what's, you know, both the, the customers, and um, they really need that, uh, be able to tune at inference time. And uh, uh, also 
be able to efficiently design algorithms and systems uh, considering all these hardware constraints. We have some work on this in this uh, direction. Um, okay. Finally, I want to thank my collaborators and uh, the uh, my previous company, SenseBrain, uh, Tetris AI, and also Sony and many of the companies I collaborate. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, I can take the question. Thank you. So perhaps we can take one question from the audience. Yes, please. Can you use the microphone here? Yeah. I have one question with regarding to the alarm former. So uh, you depend on the accuracy of the optical flow. So what? Yeah. So usually on the diff diffraction patterns, the optical flow will be totally off or something. It's not accurate. Yeah. How do you deal yeah. with that? Oh, we use the. Um, yes, there there will be. You are right. There will be errors in the uh, optical flow. Uh, so far, we used uh, after the domain alignment that image. We we use that image and the uh, UDC image to calculate the optical flow. So, so the there will domain, be so yeah. the domain adaptation will remove artifacts or no. Uh, they will remove some errors in the optical flow, but it will not completely remove the errors. Okay, so which means, uh, so how, how, how will you do with the uh, when op optical flow is totally off? Do you just use the original location, pixel location or? Right, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Jingwei, uh, for joining us this today. I know it is very, very late in your time, so I really appreciate your time here. Uh, and also want to, uh, uh, finish this section one here and uh, thank you everyone for coming um, so um, uh, let's give applause to uh, the speaker all right so uh, for the interest of time I think uh, let's take a 10 minute break and then we will resume at uh, 10 25 ish uh, 10 30 and then uh, uh, if you speak up for the second section or uh, John uh, uh, if you can come back a little bit earlier, we can set up the computer uh, for you. Thank you.
Oh, I see, I see. Okay, I'll do this. Can people on the internet uh, hear us? Uh, yep. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So, um... I can do that. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. This is better. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so, thank you for coming back. Um, this is our second uh, section. Uh, so it's really my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Zhang Chongye um, from ICE Korea to be here to teach us something about diffusion models. Okay, um, so this topic is something that I have been trying to learn, and I asked Charlie to come to and explain one. to come again, explain it again. Um, it's always my pleasure to listen. The, um, people who are actually working on this um, topic, I have a lot of lots of um, publications. So the so professor yet, um, uh, he's a uh, pretty alumni, so I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he uh, he's now a, um, a a professor in 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 Korea. Okay. Uh, so I I don't want to take more time. I will just pass the stage to um, professor yet. Um, so we have about uh, thirty five. Uh, okay. Minutes. I think you are showing the wrong screen. Oh, are you going to see that? Oh, yes. oh, okay. I see. Let me see here. Maybe I need to skip. Can you see? Huh? Then, then we we'll see. I think you oh. can duplicate this screen. Which one? So you can do this one. Okay. And then up here, there should be something. It should be a duplicate screen. So let's click this one. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So, issues. And thank you very much for the uh, introduction and kind invitation to this work, uh, workshop. And I'm Jong Choye. And today I'd like to talk about the field model for inverse problem, especially on some personal journey for the understanding of the diffusion model for inverse problem applications. So before I start, I'd like to briefly start my journey with the, the, uh, uh, a famous cake analogy from Yan Nyan Kuhn. He actually, in, in his plenary talk, he mentions that machine learning can be compared as a cake. So for example, the cherry of the K can be compared as a reinforcement learning, and the icing of the K is a supervised learning, but the whole body of the K itself is like an unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning problem. This indicates that most majority of the machine learning problem need to be solved without any label in an unsupervised manner or in self-supervised manner. As we know that he's very visionary, so we now see the surge of self-supervised learning approaches, especially in the foundation model and then nowadays, et cetera. So in fact, actually the earliest version of the self-supervised learning, especially the formula to this community is about the self-supervised denoising. For example, noise to noise is a one of the famous approaches. Here, they try to actually denoise image without any clean references, but in this cases, they have a multiple noise version of the same images. And your network is trained to estimate another noise images from different noise version of the images. And when it's trained, then if we put the input images, we can actually have a cleaner images. This is nice. However, this is not practical because you need to actually have the two version of the noise image from the same underlying clean images. In practice, usually you have a one noise image, so people try to develop a new method. For example, instead of uh, using reference as another version of the image, we actually mask the images and try to estimate the mask part version of the images from the surroundings. Once it is trained and you put the images, then you can actually have a clean version of the image. Another type of self-supervised denoising approach is based on the uh, uh, sure the Stein unsupervised risk estimator. They try to train the neural network by minimizing the sure cost function, which is composed of autoencoder loss and diversion-based penalties. 
And if you actually summarize this approach as like a supervised learning or noise to X, which includes noise to noise or noise to self, and sure, that looks a little bit different and also has some similarity. You and your network have set as trained with the noise input, but difference is the target is different. In the supervised learning cases, you have a clean input, a clean image is a target, but noise to X, uh, you have altered version of the input images as a target. In sure cases, the target is the same noise image, but to avoid trivial identity mapping, we have a, a complexity penalties. So then the question is, how can actually, the first question we had is, how can you actually unify this kinds of similarly different approaches? In fact, you know, the important clue we found is actually the, uh, the classical statistical result, which is known as a Tweedis formula. In fact, actually, you will see the, uh, the use of the Tweedis formula again and again in this uh, talk, especially in the diffusion model later. And so let me briefly review that. So Tweedis formula is about the posture density, uh, uh, the posture mean computation for the exponential family distribution. For example, if your uh, input, uh, your uh, density function given parameter eta is given by this kind of canonical decomposition, in that case, the posture mean is also has an exponential family distribution. Furthermore, one of the nice important result of the twist formula is now the posterior mean satisfy this equation. Now here, this is with respect to the, uh, this is gradient with respect to y. And now this posterior mean at the uh, uh, head eta should satisfy this equation. Now he, here you may see the very important quantity. This is gradient of log uh, uh, PDF. This is known as a score function. In fact, by solving this problem, you can actually find the cross form solution of various uh, denoising problem without any references. For example, Gaussian noise cases, Poisson noise, gamma, Voronoi, and you can see that everything is now represented with respect to the score function. So you don't need the clean data, you just need the score. Everything can be accurately presented as a score function. So that means, and also you can actually find a very interesting decomposition of the sub supervised denoising. One is actually pre-training step to estimate the score function. And the second thing is actually based on the score function, you can actually find the sampling, the clean image sampling, but in this case it's through the determinic sampling using the Tweedis formula. You can actually see that this kinds of decomposition is again and again appears in the diffusion model later, but with a little bit different sampling scheme. So then the issue is now built down to the uh, score function estimation. So how to estimate the score function? In fact, the score is actually the uh, gradient vector field pointing toward the peak point of the probability dense functions. So now the, this score function estimation has been a very important topic in the classical statistics researchers. And one of the earliest version of the method is so called the denoising autoencoder. Denoising autoencoder is try to uh, uh, estimate the output from the noise input by adding some noises, you try to estimate the original signal. And one of the results in this paper is they, they demonstrate that this denoising autoencoder is now can be, uh, can be actually presented as a score function with this term here. In fact, you may already notice this is actually the Tweedis formula for the Gaussian noise cases. So that means this denoising autoencoder itself is actually the, maybe the optimal way of addressing the Gaussian denoising problem. Furthermore, this kinds of way of a trained denoising autoencoder is basically you are now having some imagery and then adding the noise in the various level and try to train the neural network to remove the noise. This is autoencoder. In fact, this picture is taken from the tutorial, uh, uh, tutorial for the uh, diffusion model. So in fact, actually, this is actually the common scheme. And also this is how we actually estimate in this uh, in the noise to X is actually trying to do. So by adding some altering the signal and you are trying to reverse it. That's actually how this uh, conventional way of doing uh, the sub-supervised learning thing. And furthermore, one of the interesting discovery we actually made is now if actually use this uh, denoising autoencoder in the legendary form such that it R set is representing the score function, then then plug into the uh, uh, sure based denoising algorithm, you end up with a very interesting cost function here. It turns out this cost function is equal to equivalent to the 
uh, classical implicit score matching function, which is coming from the classical statistical literatures. So that means also score-based denoising algorithm is, or another, uh, is another version of the score-based approaches. So now this indicated the classical denoising algorithm like a noise to X or shear-based approaches, now uh, score-based approaches. Not only the theory is beautiful, but also the result is quite good. So if you see here, the result in the right side here is actually the score-based approaches based on the Gaussian, Poisson, and gamma noises using the noise to score. This is, by the way, this is not iterative. This is one step algorithm. And this is now uh, noise to uh, uh, shear-based approaches or so noise to self. You can actually see that significant improvement of the PSNR, also the textures are very well recovered. So the question is, yeah, this is actually starting from the denoising problem, but how can actually generalize this one for other more general inverse problem? So now in order to understand that one and also find the link with the diffusion model, you need to actually go back to what we are doing in the noise score. So you start with the noise version of the image Y here, and then the noise to score is actually adding this vector direction. So this is one step update from here to here. So that means y is very close to the peak point of probability density function. Then this is actually what well, this denoting scheme works well. Now, what about if y is far away from the sample? So you, the one step that is not working well, so you need to do some iteration. So for example, it is close to here, then you can actually do the a small number of iteration. But if it is very far, completely, for example, Gaussian noises, Basically, this is image generation. You can actually follow this gradient directions and then you can actually achieve the sample. So in fact, actually this kinds of update, ITRT update is actually the, uh, nothing but the Langevin dynamics, which is quite often used in the diffusion model. And this diffusion model using, which is called the variance exploding uh, uh, parameterization, they use follow this kind of update equation using the Langevin dynamics, as you can see here. Then what about, Another type of the diffusion model. For example, DDPM, another very popular uh, model is a little bit different derivation compared to the Langevin dynamics. This one is actually coming starting from the Markov chain. So by adding the noises, you can actually see the Markov chain of this forward noising process as Gaussian. And now the reversing process by actually reducing the step size, you can also approximate the the transition probability is a Gaussian noise model by minimizing the, uh, 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 the evidence low bound. And now you can actually see some kinds of mean estimation. In fact, this is actually uh, given in this way. So you are now training the ESETA neural network to estimate noise part. And now in this box part is basically the forward, diffuse, uh, forward noise model. So here, this is open called the uh, 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 variance preserving parameterization because actually now we are scaled down original signal and adding the noises. So this is actually the forward model and from the forward model, you try to estimate this epsilon. Now this is for the training and then the inference phases. Now you have a intermediate sample XT and then from there, you are now basically removing the noise part and then scale it and then adding smaller version of the noises as well. We are applying this one multiple times. Now you may see the similarity with this one with the noise to score here. Again, the first part of this one, I'll show you later. This is nothing but the score function estimation for the three training part. And now in the noise to score, we are just doing the deterministic sampling using the twist formula. But here now we have iterative sampling using these kinds of uh, iterations. So in fact, actually the, you can actually see that this actually cost function is nothing but the score matching thanks to these kinds of forward models. So that means actually this kinds of like a diffusion model is very closely related to the score based approaches with the reparameterization. So now the goal is how to actually use this one for the inverse problem in general inverse problem itself. So for example, the, as we all are familiar with uh, the inverse problem, which is actually the main topic here, especially for the uh, data uh, computational imaging purpose. Here, usually the X is a known images and we have a imaging setup, which is actually given by the uh, operator A here, and sometimes corrupted with the noises. And this is actually coming from the denoising problem or the blurring problem or the hazing problem and all kinds of things. 
So now this problem is a little bit different from the denoising problem we discussed before. So then how to actually incorporate this kind of imaging physics in the diffusion model? Now here in the standard actual way of estimating the inverse problem is actually minimizing data fidelity term. A is actually the imaging physics and Y is a measurement. Now, if we just do this first step, this is actually the denoising formula. We actually A is identity. Now we, are in, we need to actually incorporate uh, some kind of data consistency term. So that's actually adding some one step gradient step alternating between two. So in our earlier paper in 2022, we actually demonstrate that we start with the diffusion mode, Gaussian noise model, but at each step of the diffusion, we are now having a single step of unconditional denoising. That's actually the denoising step. And then we are doing the injection in the lemma problem cases. We have a subset of the case space measurement and that lead to the reconstruction with these blurry images. And now you are adding this kind of uh, data consistency term alternatingly. And by doing that on, you can actually have a very nice images. Furthermore, the, uh, in fact, actually this kind of idea is actually the uh, generalization of the earlier work, which is known in the super resolution problem, which is known as an IRBR problem. So here the author demonstrate a simple algorithm. Now, instead of actually training the score function in a conditional manner, they just train in an unconditional manner without knowing the Ford model at all. But now during the sampling procedure, they actually have a measurement, a small size of measurement, but they upsample it and then mix that together with this sampled version of the images. And then you can do this kind of thing again and again. In fact, without this formulation, you can see that this is a special case of our formulation we actually demonstrate here. So this is actually complete generalization for uh, problems. So, and our problem can be actually used for the uh, parallel imaging as well. And in fact, actually one of the uh, discovery we found is the result was so fantastic. So here, this was actually the result. This is actually total variation based compressed sensing result. And this is a unit based supervised learning approaches. And this is a gain based approaches. Now we have a subsampling pattern like this, but still this is better, but you can compare it to the ground truth, it's not good. But with the same data set, we can actually clearly see the details of the reconstruction and significant performance improvement. Furthermore, one of the nice thing about this diffusion model is the generalization capability. Because now here we train our score function using the Facebook need data set, but and also uh, uh, Facebook need data set but with only image daikon file data set only, but you can apply this one for the brain or like a food or spine, you can actually have a very good result with the one score functions. Furthermore, this is actually combined with automatic diagnosis tool. Uh, you can see that, which is trained with the fully sample data. We can see that diffusion model uh, captures most of the anomaly compared to compressed sensing and deep learning, other deep learning approaches. Another nice advantage of the diffusion model is actually the uncertainty quantification is for free. That means because this uh, diffusion model is a stochastic, you can actually generate from the same measurement, you can actually reconstruct multiple images. And from there, you can actually uh, calculate the variance map. And this is a variance map. You can easily see that as a sampling pattern uh, is more on the sample, you have more uncertainty, which is usually focused on the edges and ligament and those areas. So that is useful for the clinical purpose as well. So with this earlier version of it, we actually have identified some of the problem. Uh, of course, the speed is an issue. We we'll talk about that one, but we are interested in further improve this kinds of algorithm perspective. In order to understand that one, you actually start to see some of the basic mathematical uh, understanding of the diffusion model itself. Now, actually, that actually uh, that is need to be started with the understanding of high dimensional geometry, especially the concentration of measure in high dimensional geometry. So let's think about n dimensional vector, its element is a zero mean Gaussian variable. Now if you actually find the length of this vector, it turns out all of the large number says it's actually mostly focused on the distance with the sigma low, uh, root n which means that this antimatter vector is not concentrated along the origin. It's instead, it is concentrated most along the uh, hyperspheres. So this is a form of some kind of shell. Furthermore, if our, your data, clean data is like a line, 
Now you are adding the noises as well. Then you can actually see that this is actually mostly concentrated along the hyper cylinders. That means in the full diffusion process, your actual data is manifold is given like this, but you are now adding the noises by n dimensional Gaussian noises. And now this is splitted as like a shell, a narrow shells around here, high dimensional space. Same thing like this. So this is now discrete transition. So for the processing is not continuous transition. This is actually starting from the clean manifold about discrete transitions. Similarly, reverse diffusion is also reversing back from another shell to the lower level shell. It's like some kinds of quantum mechanics, right? That, and you can actually further see that this diffusion process for diffusion is very similar to the wave propagation. So you start with the manifold like this, but you are now having formed some kind of shell, but if you go further and further more, this become a, like a flat, uh, like sphere. So it's like a far field approximation of the wave field approximation. In fact, this sphere is nothing but the Gaussian. So you can see that why this, we end up with the Gaussian distribution at the end. And that means the reverse diffusion or image reconstruction is try to reverse back to arrive at this kind of original manifold. So how can you actually use this one for, uh, for designing an algorithm? In fact, that's actually the only work. Uh, this is our work in the uh, iClear this year. This is what you call the DPS algorithm. So that actually can be applied for general nonlinear inverse problem. Of course, it includes a linear inverse problem or like a phase retrieval problem or like a nonlinear mapping through the neural network like this. So you know to actually see this kind of general linear inverse uh, general nonlinear inverse problem, you need to actually think about the poster sampling. So for example, for poster sampling is we have given a, a measurement y, and you are now trying to use that using those kinds of score function. The poster score function is given using the base formula with the original score function with the data likelihood function, log likelihood function here. So that means a simple neighbor approach is just like applying this posterior score function within this diffusion model. However, the problem is now the devil is in the likelihood because the likelihood is not possible to, it's very complicated to calculate it. For example, let's think about this kinds of why measurement is actually coming from the noiseless measurement. So for the Gaussian case, it is given in this way with some constant term as well. But the problem is now during the sampling, you are now giving this alter, uh, this noisy version of the image XT here. So in order to calculate the score function for this, for this previous problem, then you need to actually compute this. But this is not possible because the reason is now this posterior density function uh, given uh, this, uh, this Y given XT is need to be computed as an integration with respect to original uh, uh, y given x zero for with the uh, sampling with the poster uh, density function. So you need to integrate that. Out. So that means uh, computing this one is intractable, then how to address it? The trick is, now instead of actually, this is expectation, why do you actually have an expectation inside here? Yeah. This is actually basically the poster mean. So we already mentioned the poster mean, computational poster mean can be done using the Tweedis formula. So using this one, you can actually apply the Tweedis formula for the, uh, the, uh, for the, the noise version of the images, and then you put it here. And in fact, this looks like a little bit similar to the Jensen's inequality, but however, this is not a Jensen's inequality because this PYX is no, uh, neither convex or no complicated. But still, you can actually find the approximation error. This is known as a Jensen's bound. So we can actually demonstrate the approximation error is bounded, upper bounded by this term. But interesting thing here is now there's a measurement noise sigma term here. So if your noise level is high enough, this approximation error can be actually negligible. So that means we can actually use this kind of Jensen's approximation. So the DPS sampling we actually develop is now, our goal is to calculate the posterior uh, score function then this was intractable. You actually changed that one using the Jensen's approximation. And then this is a score function. And now you actually use this term using the Gaussian uh, likelihood function, or for example, Poisson cases with the weighted uh, Gaussian measures uh, norms as well. So then how to actually, uh, the, uh, the mechanism we actually use this term here. So it turns out that like, uh, for example, in order to calculate this one, 
We are now forced from this XT intermediate noise images to the tweet this formula to the noisy force. And then you are calculating the uh, uh, residual error from the measurement. And then you are now back propagating it. And then from the, through the back propagating, you can actually calculate this uh, term. So in, in fact, actually, this is actually has a very, yeah, even though this looks like a, just like approximation, but it has a very interesting geometric meaning. So in our paper in last year, NURIPS, and also some of the archive paper this year, we actually have a demonstrate that is a very important geometry from this kinds of approximation. We demonstrate that if actually calculate this gradient with respect to this X tilde is based on the Twidist formula, it turns out this gradient is confined in the tangential space of this noise manifold. That means actually by updating the gradient along this direction, the sampling procedure stay in the manifold itself. That means if actually combining with this one, with the denoising from the sampling procedure, what is actually done in this DPS algorithm is like this. So at each iteration, you are now towarding, uh, you are now uh, projecting toward the clean manifold and transition to another lower level cell. And then you are now imposing the data consistent sum along this kinds of uh, tangential space and you are alternating it and then you are finally achieving this uh, point of the data consistencies. So this is how we actually have this kind of data consistency um, during the process. It turns out the result was very good. So for the phase retrieval problem, if you actually do conventional algorithm, you don't actually see good reconstruction result, but our method using just measurement here has a very nice result. And also this is non-uniform blurring, same thing. Our method is actually has a very nice result. Furthermore, like a super resolution problem or image in painting problem, 90% of pixels are missing. And also uh, non-linear blurring problem, still you can actually have a very nice reconstruction within this DPS algorithm. And also you can actually use this one for other medical application, not only for the denoising and also combining with the super resolution as well. Now, this is actually starting from, for example, in the conventional diffusion model, you start from completely Gaussian noise and then uh, remove the noise. Now, if you actually think about this kinds of process, if you are given with the noise version of the uh, MR data set, then why we are, you don't need to do this one at all, right? You start with some air by hijacking the reverse process. We are just performing this reverse diffusion only by estimating the noise level. And then using the same score function, you can also uh, considering the super resolution by assuming that the uh, downsampling operator and just imposing low frequency aggregation. Here again, to impose this constraint, we already mentioned that that need to be imposed as a manifold constant gradient. So by adding that one, you can actually clearly see significant improvement compared to, for example, noise to noise, and proposed mass. So you can see that not only the noise is removed, but also resolution is also improved as well. And also, as I mentioned, that uncertainty quantification is for free. So we can actually easily quantify the uncertainty. You can see that in this kind of liver cirrhosis uh, patient, most of the uncertainty is coming from the textures of the liver. You can actually use this kind of information for the, uh, uh, for the clinical evaluation. So, yeah, so far actually I showed that very nice result about the uh, diffusion model. But one of the downside of the diffusion model is this is iterative. So you need to actually sample quite significant number of amount of samples. For example, our earliest version of the score MRI we need to sample 2000 times, that's too big. So the question is how to accelerate it? In fact, there are a lot of actual acceleration scheme uh, available in like uh, in literatures like a DDIM or like the high over the sampling and et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we actually demonstrate some of the important discovery we made in our group. One is actually based on the denoising Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is not for the inverse problem. This is for the image generation purposes. But here, let's see what we are trying to address here. Now let's think about this clean image do domain manifold, which has a, like a multi-mode like this. But if we want to generate the sample from this mode to this mode, jumping this between the mode is not possible. So that's why people add the noises and it has become just like a one-mode Gaussian noises and then transition 
from here to another mode is easier. But the thing is, you need to actually add noises and need to do the transition. So, however, if you actually, uh, instead of doing that one, now you can actually think about a little bit more fast diffusion. So how can you do that? The key idea is now, instead of considering the, uh, uh, the sampling problem as a sampling in image domain, X domain only, now you are considering the Lipti space, which is a uh, product space with the uh, variance as well, noise level. Now within these kinds of uh, within these kinds of product spaces, every mode is connected. So that means you are trying to find the optimal path through visiting each mode. You don't need to go back all the way to here, but you can actually just go back to the next mode and then go back. So by doing that, and you can actually reduce the sampling. That means you can. This is for the initialization, and after the initialization, you can do the conventional integration using the uh, uh, reverse SD and et cetera. But still, this is for the better initialization. By doing that, and you can actually see that this result, using the same number of uh, neural uh, function evaluation, you have much better images compared to the standard way of doing the uh, image generation. Furthermore, you can see that this kinds of transition between the shell is now you can see that by doing this sampling, you can actually adaptively actually going not all the way to the here, you can actually going back and forth and then try to find the optimal level for the initialization. So, and this is some of the result using like a 100, uh, one, around 150 at, uh, NFE, you can actually have a much significant better compared to the NFE or 400. So this indicated that initialization is very important. We have a, for the efficient sampling. So now we can actually use similar kinds of idea for the conditional diffusion as well. So now let's go back to the conditional diffusion cases. Yeah, let's think about this one as a super resolution problem. You start, you have a noise, you have a like a low resolution measurement, but our goal is to increasing this clean image. Now you are injecting this data consistency during the sampling here. Yeah. Now the, however, if you see here in the earlier version of this sampling, basically there is nothing. So why this kind of part is necessary at all? So that means instead of doing that one, now let's start with this noise measurement and adding the, uh, this blurry images and adding the noise a little bit. It's like, and this is now uh, initialization similar to the uh, DMCMC we had mentioned. And now from here, you start, now we actually consider the original images and then adding noise. This looks a little bit similar, right? So the, quest, the idea is now you start from that one and do the reverse diffusion. And then during the diffusion, you are adding this kind of data consistent sum all the way. However, this is very intuitive, but however, there is a fundamental technical issues here you need to address. The first thing is, now let's think about the errors at the early initialization. But now adding the noises, I'm sorry, you have now original differences plus two versions of the Gaussian noise. So error is increasing. So how can you guarantee if you do the reverse sampling, the result is better than the original initialization? That's a question you need to address. In fact, this is a case. We theoretically demonstrated in the last year's CPR that in fact, for a uh, error reduction factor of mu, there is always exist a shortcut path of the time schedule and that which it can reduce the air construction error compared to the original one. Furthermore, another important thing is this shorter path can be reduced significantly if actually original error is reduced. This is how you can actually see this kind of diagram. This is the name of algorithm I call the CCDF. The reason is actually showing this picture. Now, if you actually starting with the very far, with the zero initialization, the initial error is quite big. So the number of sample you actually arrive at the thing is many. However, you start with the better initialization in one step diffusion, and then you can do the reverse. You can actually reduce the number of re uh, reverse sample. Same thing, if you actually do some, you have a, some like a feed for neural network, it's a better initialization and adding noise, you can actually further significantly reduce the uh, number of sampling step. So in fact, actually, what it demonstrates, yeah, the basic idea is now the error increasing rate of this one is slower compared to this one. In fact, this is exponentially decaying. Then in that case, this kind of thing happened. 
theoretically, we demonstrate this is really the case. The reason is that we can actually show that the reverse diffusion is contracting. That, uh, in fact, this is stochastic contracting with the contraction factor of lambda here. So at each iteration, the error is reduced by exponentially. Furthermore, what it demonstrates is the lambda factor for the DDPM and SLMD and DDIM can be given in this way. And this is always less than one. So that's why this reverse diffusion is exponentially decaying, decaying and there is a short cut path. So with this kinds of algorithm, we can actually demonstrate that with only 20 step diffusion, we can actually have a significant improvement compared to the older competitors, as you can see here. Same thing, image in painting, using only 20 step diffusion, you can actually have a very nice result compared to the RI competitors. So then now the next question we want to address is what if, if our Ford model is not known, like a blind deconvolution. For example, blind deconvolution cases, the block corner is not known. So can you actually use this diffusion model to address this problem? In fact, the idea we actually have is now try to assume that convolution corner and the image underlying image is independent. And based on that, you can actually have this kinds of decomposition. And then this is, we are considering the image prior as well as a corner prior. And then we are in thinking about the diffusion for both images and corners. So we are actually, uh, our algorithm is also doing the diffusion for the images and corner together. So this is what happened. So now we are from here, this is a non-blind cases. We have a corner and we, are, we have an image diffusion. We are now trying to minimize, uh, using the, uh, uh, the uh, Tweedy's formula, and then you are trying to minimize the residual. But instead of doing that one, now the same thing, we are doing the diffusion and Tweedy's formula, and you have an estimation, and then you are now doing this residual and back propagating for both images and corner priors. So now we apply this one, for blind deconvolution problem and also imaging through the tablet, some of the topic we discussed earlier this morning. So we apply this to blind deconvolution uh, the, uh, problems as well. This is a result for the blind deblurring problem. So the measurement is here and underlying ground truth, the corner is a little complicated motion blur. But still our algorithm can estimate the images and the blur corner accurately. Same thing, this kinds of uh, imaging through the turbulence, the measurement is like this, but you can actually estimate the uh, turbulence parameter very well, and then you can actually obtain the images. And now we can actually scale up this algorithm for the series method problem as well, for the, especially for the medical imaging problem, like uh, for example, limited angle tomography problem, or sparse view CT problem, or like a compressed sensing MRI problem, everything is actually the three dimensional. However, if I just apply this one for the 3D mandate diffusion model, that's very difficult because it's a large volume, it's computationally and also memory very high. So you can use this one in a diffusion model in the 3D mandate way. So how to address this problem? So here, our goal is augmenting the diffusion model with the model-based approaches together. So that means now for the XY dimension, two dimensional cases, we use a diffusion prior but for the G direction, we actually use a total variation prior together. So that means we are now doing the diffusion model parallelly for each step and then combining all the slides together. We are using the data consistent with the TV prior together. That can be combined with the algorithm. And in this manner, for the score function estimation parallelly and using the ADMM algorithm, you can actually combine this information at each iteration. This is some of the result with the sparse view CT. We can actually see that within only like eight view cases, we have a nice reconstruction as you can see in this kinds of demos and also total volume as well. And also you can actually see the, the construction for the limited angle tomography or compressed sensing MRI problem. Still the algorithm give a very nice reconstruction result. Now, furthermore, we can actually uh, uh, extend this algorithm for better reconstruction, especially like uh, for example, uh, GSLIS super resolution and also compressing the MRI and also yes, three dimensional image generation itself. The combination of the model based prior with the two dimensional is not enough, especially for the image generation. So, how to address this problem? We actually listened to demonstrate that the, doing the, like, a, uh, doing the uh, two, two orthogonal 
also going to diffusion model along the xy direction and yz direction together, alternating them together to sample, you can actually have a very nice result. For example, this is an image generation from the complete noise. Still, you can clearly see that MR image, quite three dimensional, accurate crystal volume can be generated using a two diffusion model. And this is a, a slice, uh, the, uh, the slice uh, super resolution problem. You can see that from here, you can actually have a very nice reconstruction together. In summary, so we actually demonstrate that score-based approaches is a very important path for solving inverse problem. And it is very universal. It can be solved all kinds of like inverse problem. And also it has a very good generalization capability. And now we can actually do the acceleration scheme and advanced cycles based understanding of the uh, geometry and stochastic contraction matches. With that, I'd like to conclude my talk. Thank you. So actually, I have two questions. The first one is uh, we all know that the SD functions, uh, SDE functions, and those diffusion models are all based on the big assumption that the statistic process follow the Gaussian distribution. However, when we try to apply the diffusion model, maybe to remove the noise in the inputs. So what if the input noise actually containing, I mean, different types of noise? like the poison noise or the impulse noise and yeah that's a good question mm -hmm. in fact actually the the algorithm itself the sampling procedure is actually we are on purpose adding gaussian noise but mm -hmm. we don't assume any kinds of uh gaussian analytics in the measurement noise lab for example here you can actually, this part is, can be any, any kinds of noise model. It can be a Poisson noise model or Gaussian, or it can be actually coming from like a neural network or whatever, or even the classifier. So that means you don't need to assume any kinds of Gaussian needs in the measurement noise level. Yeah, we can apply okay. for all kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, my second question is about the, like um, the application on the um, medical images because, it seems like um, diffusion model is a powerful generating model. However, in the medical image processing, we also need to preserve the accuracy of the data. We don't want to generate the fake contents. However, based on some of the results, um, um, like I've seen in the slides, it seems like the generated contents is not like 100% accurate mm -hmm. compared with the, the ground truth. So, uh, Will that arise some concerns or how, how you can ensure that? I mean, yeah, that's a, in fact, actually, the, you don't, yeah, maybe in Paris, you may see the differences in these pictures here. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. this head is different from the ground truth, right? Yeah. However, see, if you see the original measurement itself, if you blur this one or this blur this one, this is basically the looks similar. That means, yeah, in fact, it's this diffusion model. It's nothing but the prior model, okay? Mm -hmm. And now all the thing in this is guided by the data consistency. Mm -hmm. That means we can actually construct, we can guarantee the uh, true, uh, guarantee that the result reconstruction satisfy the measurement noise level, uh, measurement model that actually guide that hallucination and et cetera under the measurement uh, data consistency. However, as, I mean, as you can see here, there is some kinds of ill poisonous. It can be a little bit different, right? As long as it can actually same kinds of measurement. So that's why I actually, we actually said that uncertainty quantification is very important. Depending on the different sample, this kinds of texture may be different. So by providing those kinds of uncertainty map to the data clinician, may say, they say maybe this uncertainty too much, so we can actually reduce acceleration factor. And yeah, those kind of thing, or maybe you can actually focus less attention in this kinds of uncertain areas and something like that. We can actually provide those information in the diffusion model as well. Yeah, yeah thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a follow-up question on that as I'm trying to really understand the, um, the uncertainty quantification and try to interpret the, um, mm -hmm. the scalar field that I saw. So I think this image is a really good example mm -hmm. because intuitively I would think that the uncertainty map would be 
very high for the hat, for instance? Mm -hmm. Is that actually what you see when you plot the, uh, the uncertainty map on this image? Yeah, actually, we didn't actually compute the uncertainties for this particular images. But however, if you go, this map, okay? This is actually the uh, MI denoising problem with uh, for starting from the high noise level. Now on certain map, yeah, this is actually liver cirrhosis patient. Now it has a very different kinds of textures in the liver, okay? Now on certain is mostly focuses in those area because texture is very in detail. So every iteration, it may have a different kinds of reconstruction. So those kinds of thing may be focuses here, okay? And well, yeah, so that's actually what you can easily expect, right? But other than that, overall shape and all those kinds of things is basically certain, yeah. Same thing, if you go back to this ML construction here, this gives a very good example as well. If you do the downsampling factor of two on four and the reconstruction, uncertainty is basically very small and uniform. But if you have a more and more acceleration factor, uncertainty is mainly focused on the ligament and those kinds of edge area. That's what you can easily expect. That's actually add iteration that those may be blurred. So this kinds of uncertainty quantification map is provides those kinds of information. Yeah. Is the uncertainty um, does the uncertainty expect some sort of um, distribution that you're trying to? Oh yeah, because we can actually construct them multiple time. Yeah. And then you can actually calculate the variance at each pixel level. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So that means if this uncertainty is not allowed, okay, then maybe you shouldn't use this excellent factor of A. That's how we can actually use this uncertainty maps in the clinical purpose. Or this is still okay, then maybe excellent factor five, uh, four may be a good for the practice as well. Yeah. 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 Mm. Question about your acceleration method. Mm -hmm. um, is that kind of, can you relate that to something like, uh, like, you know, multi grid methods where you do, uh, if you put that diagram back up that you had for the acceleration, like it, it sort of reminds me of, I mean, as you increase the noise level, it's essentially like reducing the resolution. Yeah. So you're jumping between these resolutions. It kind of feels a little bit like a multi grid algorithm for solving PDEs. Or uh, like the W cycle or the V cycle, you know all those yeah. things, right? Is that is that what you're doing, or is it inspired by that, or is it? Am I completely lost here? Or... Yeah, that may be a very interesting connection. But here, the reason this is this is not those kinds of discrete multi grain, okay? Okay. Because this is actually adding the noise, Gaussian noises, right. and so that's smoothly in the Gaussian noise in the adding Gaussian noise in the pixel domain is basically convolution in the Gaussian corner in the PDF. So that's why actually the PDF then is becoming blurry and bold. But you are jumping between noise levels, right? Yeah, because actually as I mentioned from the Gaussian cell theorem, the adding the noise is like a discrete transition. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of transition. So the question is, for example, if we want to generate a sample, it is more than this mode, mm -hmm. then you don't need to go back all the way to the one more. You can just do the intermediate version, which is connected. Then you can actually jump from here to yeah, here. Yeah, kind of, but isn't that like what a V cycle does? That might be related, but I don't know. <laughs> That's anyway. a good point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, so I just switched my computer. I just
just want to make sure people on Zoom can uh, still hear me. Yes, okay. we can. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Vishal, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. All right. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Vishal Patel uh, from uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University. So, um, so I know Vishal for quite a bit of time. So he uh, he got his uh, degree from um, Maryland, I assume, right, with uh, Professor Rama Chalapa. And since then, he's been working on many, many great things, uh, including the most recent one on uh, various types of weather conditions. Um, uh, and I, 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 I just, um, I'm, he and I are in the same Briar program by IRPAR. And so I've, I've been learning a lot uh, from him uh, through the past uh, year or so. So I'm really excited to have Michelle here, although remotely, uh, I'm still very excited to hear about your talk. Um, so. Thank you. Uh, and uh, let me see. So we have time until maybe um, 11.55 slash 12 o'clock. Is it okay? Sure, sure. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Stanley. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction and thank you again for the invitation to give a talk at this uh, wonderful workshop. You know, the, the, the topics which are covered in this workshop are very dear to me. Uh, we've been working on uh, image restoration, enhancement, object detection, uh, problems for quite some time. So uh, today I'll be talking about some of the um, methods that we've developed um, recently in terms of uh, domain adaptive object detection. And the idea here is to uh, develop robust uh, detection frameworks which can detect objects um, in variety of different you know, weather conditions such as rain, haze, uh, turbulence, and what, what have you. So um, you know, we all know uh, what we mean by object detection. It's essentially a localization and classification problem. So the idea is that given an image like this, you want to sort of draw very tight bounding boxes around the objects that appear and also attach a label to it. And that's sort of the one of the fundamental problems uh, in computer vision, whether it's autonomous navigation or biometrics or whatever application that you're dealing with, the detection is, you know, probably one of the first steps that you sort of require. So if you look at the, um, the literature, especially the deep learning literature, uh, we have seen a number of different techniques over the years, um, starting from RCNN, which was uh, one of the first um, CNN-based object detection framework. And there were some improvements of that framework, uh, you know, fast RCNN and, uh, you know, faster RCNN. We have YOLO, we have uh, RetinaNet, and we, we have many other uh, powerful uh, object detection frameworks. And uh, all of these detection approaches are, are basically they've shown to perform uh, very well on a number of different um, you know, data sets, including various applications, whether it's medical imaging or autonomous navigation, surveillance or, or face recognition. And one of the, um, the, the major reasons why we've seen such a, a significant improvement in object detection over the years is one, that we have very interesting architectures, and two, uh, we have uh, millions or thousands, millions, millions of you know, annotated samples to train the network. And with that, we now have very robust um, detection frameworks. But what I argue is that even though you take any of these uh, detection frameworks, they may be trained on um, uh, you know, thousands, maybe millions of samples, um, they may be addressing a particular challenge, maybe it's just an object uh, uh, detection or maybe just a face detection. But when you sort of deploy them in the wild conditions, uh, then they, they are fundamentally limited. And let me just give you an example. So when we have um, an object detection framework, uh, let's say for autonomous navigation system, uh, you have this uh, vehicle which is moving, it has some cameras, and it looks at the, the scene, whatever it sees in front of the car. And the, one of the major components is that you have to sort of detect uh, and segment, essentially detect the objects that you see, whether it's cars or pedestrians or stop sign or, sign or what have you. And, you know, these uh, frameworks basically, you know, they work well. I mean, if you, you know, have uh, collected a, a reasonable number of uh, uh, samples for that particular application, and then you can basically have a very good detector. And let's say you, you trained it 
and then you deploy it somewhere in Canada, for instance, right, uh, where it snows a lot, or maybe Boston um, in winter time, and uh, all of a sudden you see this, you know, hazy and snowy day. And uh, when you're using this autonomous navigation system, now the system is forced to detect objects in the presence of, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, snow. And in that case, the detector will completely fail. And this happens because of, there is a significant distribution gap, right? The, the detector has been trained on somewhat good looking imagery, but in the wild, in practice, in practical applications, we basically see extremely, you know, uh, different conditions, um, rain, haze, snow, extreme light, maybe blur, maybe turbulence if it's a long range. So this is sort of what we have to deal with, right? So the, the question is, you know, we have a, a training set, which might be reasonable. It may have some sort of distribution, but when it comes to deployment, it may have completely different uh, sort of distribution. So how do you sort of adapt? How do you make a detector, which is already working well on a particular data set, how do you adapt that? How do you make it better on a target distribution, which is maybe adverse weather conditions, right? So how do you do that? And this is a practical problem. This happens all the time. And there are many other uh, sort of uh, cases, right, where we see this problem of domain gap. Um, you know, the example that I gave you was basically, you know, you have trained a detector on a clean uh, imagery, and then you have to sort of apply it on a hazy, right? So that's a, a data set. You have cityscapes to foggy cityscapes. Uh, you may have uh, a scenario where you want to be able to detect objects uh, in a low light and uh, nighttime conditions. And in that case, you have to rely on uh, infrared thermal cameras. Uh, so now you have an object detection framework, which works very well in visible domain. But now you have to detect on the thermal domain because there is a significant distribution shift. The object detector will completely fail. Um, you... Maybe you know you're working in uh, Italy, maybe in Rome, and you 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 know you collect data maybe in Rome and maybe Italian cities, and then you, you sort of uh, see that the, the detection works very well. But now you deploy that model to some Asian country, maybe like in Japan and Tokyo, for instance, where the streets, the signs, the the, the, the everything is different, and in that case, the detection will also fail because everything looks different. Uh, it doesn't look like uh, you know uh, people. In Rome, it doesn't look, you know, there's, there's, the signs are different, the roads look different, everything is different. So that's a practical problem that we have to address. And very recently, you know, there is this uh, sort of uh, uh, discussion, there is this, uh, you know, topic of synthetic to real transfer, right? So collecting and annotating data sets in a real world is very difficult. So we rely on synthetic data sets um, where we can just artificially generate imagery with the annotations. So we can train uh, detectors, but when it comes to deploying them on real world, there is always this, you know, a gap, a synthetic to real gap that we have to deal with, right? So these are some of the sort of use cases the, the, where, you know, we really need a robust detection framework. And in all of these examples, um, on the right-hand side, basically, right, is basically the target domain. And all these red um, boxes show the missed detection, right? So you can see the... In the source domain, where the detector works very well, I mean, you see very few of them, but as soon as you deploy it on the target domain, it just completely fails, right? You see a lot of those red boxes. So um, this is a problem that we're interested in addressing, right? So in this uh, literature, we often, you know, use the language, you know, the, the notion of, we, we often view the data set that we use to train the model as a source domain and the data set where we have to sort of evaluate which has a different distribution, we call it the target uh, domain. Okay, so how do you take a detector from source and transfer it to the target domain? So you're able to now detect objects in the target domain. Well, if um, I have um, a way, right? So this is a problem that I have to address, but if I have a, a, a way to sort of uh, collect and annotate samples in the target domain. So let's say if I'm addressing this problem of thermal to visible, uh, visible to thermal transfer learning. If I can connect, uh, collect thousands, maybe millions of samples in the target domain, which is thermal domain, not only collect them, but also annotate them, meaning that for each image, I wanna be able to draw bound boxes around the objects that I see. Then basically the problem is solved, right? All I have, because remember in, in this, problem, we are basically interested in detecting objects in the target domain. So if I can collect 
and annotate samples in the target domain, then I can basically train, you know, one of these object detection frameworks on the target domain and the problem is solved. But the problem is we don't really, you know, have, um, you know, those data sets available to us. Uh, it could be because of, you know, uh, the sensors are very expensive. The, the collecting, you know, thermal imagery is extremely labor intensive. It may be time consuming process and it can be very expensive, right? So if you're able to do that, then it's a good thing, but almost certainly you will never be able to do that, right? So that option is just not possible for us. So instead, what we do is basically we rely on developing a machine learning algorithm that can basically take um, a source in model and transfer it to the target domain. And that's basically what we refer to as domain adaptation. And uh, the idea here is to increase the models, detection models, generalization capability and robustness to sort of a new uh, domain. Within domain adaptation, there are uh, different sort of categories or different sub-problems. Um, one of the widely used uh, uh, adaptation framework is called unsupervised domain adaptation, uh, where the idea is that you have a labeled source data. So again, we will keep referring to thermal to visible to thermal transfer learning. So the labeled source data is now uh, labeled visible images and you have unlabeled thermal images. And the idea is that you already have um, uh, a set of labeled uh, data in the visible domain. Can I basically transfer the knowledge to the uh, thermal? You have labeled uh, visible data and you have a detector that you want to transfer to the thermal domain, right? The key here is that target uh, domain uh, data, which are not labeled. So they're completely unlabeled data. So this is known as unsupervised domain adaptation. Then there is this notion of source-free domain adaptation, where the idea is that let's say um, you're in the, the business of selling object detectors. Maybe Amazon has a robust framework for selling an object detection framework. You buy one of the detection uh, detectors from Amazon. Um, Amazon will never give you uh, the data set that they used to train the model. What they, they may give you is the detection framework, maybe the uh, model parameters, but that's pretty much it. So now you have this black box and you know its parameter. Now it may be trained on visible data, but your application requires you to detect objects in the thermal domain. So how do you sort of take that black box and make it useful to you for your application, which is thermal object detection? So the idea here is that you have no uh, access to the source data, which are thousands or millions of annotated samples in the visible domain. The only thing you have is a source train model. And now you have to adapt that to your target imagery. And the interesting thing is that the target data may be uh, not even labeled, right? So this is known as a source free adaptation where you have no access to the source data, uh, but only the train model. And finally, um, there is this notion of the test time adaptation or fully test time adaptation. So if you look at the unsupervised adaptation, or source-free domain adaptation, in both of these approaches, we assume we start, we have a very well-trained model in the source domain, and we want to adapt it to the target domain, which is thermal domain, or maybe adverse weather condition, like hazy condition. So you have to know a priori which domain you want to uh, sort of adapt your detector to. But in practice, that is not, never the case. You, you know, when you're driving an uh, autonomous navigation system, you know, uh, there, there, there have been cases where we live in Maryland, for instance, you know, in a single day, you have rain in the morning, you have extreme light in the uh, you know afternoon, and maybe at nighttime you have, uh, maybe it's very low light, right? So you have three different kinds of conditions in a single day, right? So it, it's just not possible to assume that you know what kind of condition you'll be dealing with a priori. So the idea in fully test time adaptation is to be able to deal with whatever test distribution that you may be forced to deal with, you want to sort of solve a very lightweight optimization problem so you can deal with, you can adapt um, uh, the, the well-trained source model to your test distribution that you see in real time, okay? So these are some of the, um, the, the ways we can sort of address a domain adaptation problem, depending on how constrained or unconstrained uh, the, the, the problem is. And what I'll do in the remaining time that I have is uh, basically then one of, uh, one uh, sort of method for each of these adaptation scenarios for object detection. 
uh, in our framework, we uh, you know rely on this faster RCNN framework, uh, even though they're generic. I mean, you can basically apply it to any uh, detection framework, but it just happens that we use the faster RCNN. Uh, and if you recall, uh, the faster RCNN, you have this uh, backbone, which is uh, the encoder network. It could be uh, VGG or it could be ResNet. You have this RP region proposal network, which uh, basically you know, it gives you sort of this um, you know, regions in the feature space where the network thinks that there is some presence of objects, right? So you have these uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, features, uh, but they are sort of, you know, of different sizes. So you have this ROI pooling layer, which sort of puts them in a sort of the same grid, if you will, or dimension. And then you have this uh, sort of uh, a lightweight, uh, fully connected layers, which do sort of the bounding box regression and classification. And this, the entire pipeline is sort of trained in end-to-end -end fashion. Uh, with uh, some training data. Um, so one of the first things we did, uh, sort of this is very uh, old, I guess about three years old. Uh, in ECCV 2020, uh, we uh, developed a method uh, to address uh, object uh, detection for adverse weather condition. And um, in uh, and this is an unsupervised domain adaptation method. So uh, the idea is that the target domain, which is adverse weather condition data, uh, they're unlabeled, but you do have a label um, uh, you know, uh, data set uh, for the source domain, which is sort of the clean uh, data set. So when it comes to the unsupervised domain adaptation, pretty much um, I would say 90% of the methods uh, make use of this idea here. It's called gradient reversal, uh, which was published in the ICML 2015. Uh, probably one of, the <laughs> one of the only papers that I know from Russia, and it's uh, very highly cited, in fact. So um, the idea is very simple. It's very close to what we see in uh, generative adversarial networks. So the idea is that um, it's basically for uh, a classification. Uh, so the idea is that you have a classification branch at the top. The uh, the green component corresponds to the feature extractor. And this uh, blue component is basically the linear part where you have this uh, sort of the classifier, right? You have the uh, C-class problem and sort of uh, you train that network in an end-to-end -end fashion if you just have a classification problem. What the authors do is that they attach this sort of a domain classifier. Uh, it's a very uh, lightweight sort of a linear component uh, whose objective is to essentially determine whether the input image comes from the source domain or the target domain. So given an image, this uh, domain classifier basically determines whether it's from the source domain or target domain. So if you recall, the way we train a neural network is that you have an image, you do a feed forward, Whatever the, you get the prediction, you compare it with the ground truth, you have a loss function, you do back propagation. When you do back propagation, you basically propagate the gradients. So while back propagating the gradients, what uh, the, the authors propose is that from this gradient reversal layer, um, basically they flip the sign of the gradient. So up to this point, right, it, the, the, the sign is just like, you know, for the domain classifier, it says it's a source domain. And when they do back propagation, they just basically attach a negative sign. By doing that, what they're obtaining is that they're basically confusing this feature extractor. In other words, by switching the sign, now the, the feature extractor gets a bit confused and it has no information whether you know, the, uh, the, the image corresponds to the source domain or the target domain. So as a result, the feature extractor basically extracts features which are domain invariant, right? And if you basically compare this framework with the generative adversary networks and this domain classifier essentially plays the role of a, a, a sort of the, uh, discriminator that we have, right? So this is a very powerful technique that pretty much uh, is um, being adapted to various um, unsupervised adaptation tasks, including segmentation, uh, detection, and classification. So this was proposed for classification in 2015, but then people basically started adapting it for detection. And then there were one of the very first approaches for domain adaptive object detection, unsupervised uh, domain adaptation, was basically based on this you know, um, uh, gradient reversal approach. And the authors uh, basically applied, they took the faster RCNN um, uh, pipeline and they basically added this gradient reversal uh, um, on both the image level features and the object level features. So you basically see that instance and the image level features. So that's it. And, and basically with that, they were able to obtain a reasonable results. And then there was an improvement in, uh, of this method uh, uh, which was proposed in 20, CVPR 2019, where they basically do the same thing. Uh, they apply this gradient reversal, but now at multiple uh, uh, feature layers of the network. So they, they do gradient reversal at multiple layers, right? So when you look at these approaches, um, they are basically um, sort of 
limited in some sense. And, and, and basically in, in both of these approaches, there is no information uh, that is being used, like the physics of image formation, right? So if you look at the adverse weather conditions, whether it's a haze or rain or what have you, there is actually a forward process that describes how a rain would look like if you start from a clean image or how a hazy image is related to the clean image. So none of these methods make use of that physics of image formation. And also when they do this gradient reversal, right? This gradient, uh, uh, this uh, domain classifier basically says that the image that you start with is whether it's from the source domain or the target domain. So uh, the domain information is global, right? So what we uh, proposed was to rather, um, you know, make use of this um, image formation model into the detection pipeline. And if you look at this base model or the brain model, and these are simplified models. Uh, there are other, you know, advanced models uh, for this, but you can be basically relate a clean image with a hazy image and, and, and a rain image with the so on and so forth, right? So you have this sort of uh, model that you can leverage. In other words, a, a hazy image, you know, you can make use of so-called the transmission map. And in a rainy image is a superposition of a clean image with the raindrops, which we call rain residuals, right? So can we use this information, right? And that's basically what is shown in this uh, figure. So hazy image is a function of clean image and the transmission map. A rainy image is a function of clean image and sort of uh, rain residuals. And also, if you look at a sort of, let's say, a hazy image, and if you look at sort of, uh, you know, if you extract a patch, then what you see is that the, if you look at the pixel values, right? the haze or the rain, it's not uniform, right? Especially in this example that I'm showing here, you see based on these values that you see is really not uniform, depending on where you're looking at um, uh, in the image, uh, you, you really get this, uh, you know, varying levels of sort of, you know, change uh, in the image, uh, depending on the haze, depending on the condition that you see. Um, when, these methods use this gradient reversal. What they say is that whether an image has a source, it comes from a source domain or the target domain, and then they basically flip the gradient sign. So what we propose is that this gradient, or the, the domain information is not uniform. So when we sort of flip the gradient sign, we are saying that the domain, the, the hazy condition is the same in the entire image, which is really not, not true because it's, it is not, right? So basically with those two things, we sort of modified the approach. And this is the traditional sort of the domain adaptation approach where we uh, add this gradient rever reversal layer, right? The domain discriminator network. But basically it just determines whether the image uh, is from the source domain or the target domain. And that's uh, the previous approaches, right? Instead of this, what we proposed was to replace this domain discriminator network with uh, so-called the prior estimation network. And the objective of this prior estimation network is to basically estimate the prior that comes in the input image. So if it's a hazy image, then this prior estimation network will basically uh, recover the transmission map. If it's a rainy image, it will you know, sort of uh, recover the rain residuals and so on and so forth. So that prior that we get, which is not uniform, is basically being captured by this uh, prior estimation network. And we do this at multiple stages, basically. And then there was this uh, NeurIPS paper, which uh, basically said that if you apply these residual connections, then it improves uh, the uh, performance of unsupervised domain adaptation. So we also add that. And we, we do this at multiple stages. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the remaining part of the, the, uh, the network is, is the same. So once we have this prior estimation network, which estimates the uh, sort of the prior, which is the condition that appears in the, uh, the image, uh, we basically flip the gradients based on them, right? So we, we now make use of this and basically reverse that and then do adaptation. So everything is the same. Before it was the, um, the, uh, the domain classifier, but now we rely on this uh, prior estimation, a uh, 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 prior estimation block to determine the condition that is present. And then basically we flip the, the gradient sign. And as a result, we basically make sure that the, the feature extractor network gets confused and it basically generates features which are domain invariant. So that's basically uh, where we use uh, the, the image formation model and uh, uh, on top of these uh, existing methods. And we applied this technique on a variety of different uh, domain adaptation scenarios, cityscapes to foggy cityscapes uh, in the presence of rain and, and so on and so forth. 
So in, uh, again, this is uh, something uh, that we did uh, a few couple of uh, years ago. Uh, and at that time, uh, the results that we were obtaining were somewhat state of the art, I guess, right? So um, the proposed technique, right, on a variety of different so cityscapes to RTTS, uh, you can see that we get significant improvements. Uh, on the wider faces to UFDD, which is the rainy. So the idea is that you want to do a face detection from clean images. Now you want to be able to detect faces in the rainy images um, uh, and hazy images. Uh, and even there, we see a significant improvement, right? Uh, similarly, if you if you go from uh, uh, you know uh, you know cityscapes to rainy cityscapes and rainy condition, you you see a significant improvement. Uh, similarly, in the face uh, data set as well, right? So at that time, you know, this was one of the state of the art uh, detector for uh, unsupervised domain um, adaptive object detection. And these are some of the, excuse me, visual comparisons where you can see on the left hand side is the faster uh, RCNN, the, the, the previous state of the art. And on the right hand side is basically the proposed method. And you can see that the, uh, the, uh, the, we get high quality predictions and we get uh, reduced false negatives, right? So all the, 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 the yellow and the orange you know, boxes are sort of removed and we get much better predictions, right? So this was something uh, we did in ECCV 2020, a uh, long time ago. And now let's move on to the other type of uh, domain adaptation, which is the source-free domain adaptation. And again, this is mainly because of privacy issues. You, you know, a lot of the times we don't have access to the source um, uh, data, but rather just the source train model. And you now want to take this uh, source train model, this black box, and be able to sort of do something to it. So now you can detect objects in the target domain in uh, adverse weather condition, in um, thermal imagery, or what have you. So a simple approach would be to take this source train model and apply the target uh, imagery, uh, thermal imagery, or uh, you know an image in adverse weather condition, and look at what kind of detections are produced by this source train model. Obviously it's not trained on adverse weather conditions so the outputs will be extremely noisy, but that's the best you can do. So let's say this uh, model uh, produces uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know, outputs. This can be now used as the uh, uh, sort of the uh, you know, pseudo labels to train uh, a model. Uh, and basically you can repeat the process. And, and as a result, you would now have um, a model which is uh, good for the target uh, domain. But the problem is that, you know, when you do this, uh, this sort of very well-trained model on the source domain, it forgets, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of suffers from catastrophic forgetting because it, it just by using this uh, pseudo ground truth, right? It just doesn't really work well. So what we did was um, we uh, wanted to go back and let the, the pipeline and, and see where the errors come from. So this slide basically shows that um, when you have a source train model, and if you just apply it on the target uh, sam uh, sample, so here in an example is a hazy condition, then what you see is that it produces a lot of these bounding boxes around the car object. So basically what you see is that even though there is a very you know, tight bounding box around the car uh, uh, bus, it gives, uh, you know, with a high confidence, it says that it's 93% it's certain that it's a truck, even though it's a car, right? So basically what this indicates is that the, um, a small shift in the region proposal, you know, a location will lead to large shift in the feature space. So this is basically without any adaptation, right? Source train model evaluated on the target domain. So this is a problem that we have to address. If you want to develop a robust detector, um, we have to minimize this error. So how do we do that? And to do that, we basically uh, want to go to uh, contrastive learning, right? So again, if you look at this, uh, you know, uh, uh, source train model applied on the target uh, data set, then you see there are a whole bunch of these regional proposals around the bus object. If you remember, uh, if you recall, the way we do contrastive learning is that you have these sort of positive pairs and negative pairs. You, you want to pull, you know, the, the features corresponding to the positive samples, and you want to push, push them away from the features from the negative samples, right? So you need sort of these positive pairs and negative pairs. When you look at this image on the left hand side, these region proposals essentially give you this multiple views which are required for you to do contrastive learning. You have a whole bunch of region proposals around the bus and some of uh, the background. The only issue is that we don't know which one is which because this is completely unsupported. These are a whole bunch of bounding boxes. But if you were to do contrastive learning, you need to figure out which one of these bounding boxes correspond to 
the bus object and remaining are the negative objects, right? Uh, for your contrastive learning. So how do we do that? To do that, we basically rely on uh, uh, graph neural network. I know I'm running out of time, but I'll, I'll pick up the pace now. So the idea is that um, you have this uh, sample um, um, and uh, we basically rely on uh, knowledge distillation, a student teacher uh, network kind of uh, framework where we apply a strong augmentation on the student uh, network and the weak augmentation on the teacher network. Again, remember this teacher network is trained on the source uh, data um, and um, the region proposals, which are basically obtained by the teacher network are used as the pseudo labels to sort of guide the, 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 the student network uh, and to update the student network parameter. And then once you have that, you use the uh, exponential moving average to update the teacher uh, parameters, right? So this is sort of the, the classical uh, knowledge distillation framework. The only issue is that um, given this, you know, region proposals, these features uh, from the R uh, layer, uh, let's say you have these, uh, you know, features, you don't know which one is which. We don't know which features correspond to the bus uh, class and which correspond to the car or the background class. We just have a whole bunch of these features. So to get this positive and uh, negative pairs, we rely on this um, so-called the instance relation graph. So we view these features as uh, sort of the um, the nodes in a, in, a, in, a, in a graph. So each feature can be viewed as a node and the edges basically come, you know, sort of capture a relation among these different features. With this uh, a graph neural network, we basically get a pairwise similarity uh, from which we basically get the pairwise labels. In other words, once you have this uh, a graph neural network, you sort of uh, you do some processing, you get pairwise similarity, you threshold it and you get pairwise labels. So in these pairwise labels, you get this positive, uh, uh, the black dots, which are the positive pairs and all the white ones are the negative. So you can now do contrastive learning, right? So this is the idea. And again, this uh, figure shows how we do it in detail, but you, I hope you got the idea. Uh, the overall loss function is basically the sum of you know, the pseudo label, which is from the knowledge distillation and the graph contrastive loss. And uh, these are some of the results. So the idea is that uh, if you uh, apply this uh, method, again, this is source free, meaning that we don't have uh, knowledge of the source data. Uh, so we go from cityscapes to foggy cityscapes. The source only is sort of the, 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 the worst you can do. The Oracle is the target only, that's the upper bound. And when we apply this, uh, uh, you know, source free model, we got significant improvements. And when we worked on this, this was state of the art in this data set. And these are uh, some additional experiments on a variety of different uh, uh, scenarios like Pascal VOC to clip art, uh, from synthetic to real, from uh, you know, Pascal VOC to watercolor and so on and so forth. And uh, this slide basically shows you know, how we improve the pairwise similarity before and after this uh, graph neural network and thresholding, right? Here are some examples where you have a classical knowledge distillation, which basically fails. Uh, but when you apply sort of our method, you can see much better detections, right? So for instance, on the left-hand side, this bus is completely missed. Uh, this car here is missed, but our, our detector, uh, it uh, sort of detects them well. In this clip art, you get these two sort of, uh, you know, are missed, but in our, our detection, we, we, we capture them, right? Five more minutes, I'll quickly uh, summarize the, uh, the latest uh, that we've done in fully test time adaptation. But the idea here is again, in the previous two approaches, we have to know the, the knowledge of the test uh, domain or the target domain that we are sort of uh, adapting our detector to. But in practice, we just don't know that a priori. So the idea in test time adaptation is that you have a source train model, which is trained on a good looking imagery, but during testing, you can have a very you know, crazy looking imagery, a fog or, or, or rain or haze or, or extreme illumination. So the idea is that you take this model, depending on the target distribution, whatever you see during testing, you wanna quickly uh, solve a lightweight optimization. So now you can adapt your sort of source train model to, to, to the target distribution that you see in real time, right? And this slide sort of compares uh, how you wanna do it. So if you look at the unsupervised source free or fully test time, you basically, only thing you require is the test sample because you have no knowledge of the source data and you wanna come up with some sort of loss function based on your test sample to sort of adapt that uh, uh, well-trained model to your tar target distribution. So how do we do that? So remember, we have, a, 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 again, a, a well-trained model on the source domain data. So we, again, rely on a knowledge distillation framework. We have a target uh, a, a test sample. We apply strong and weak augmentations. 
uh, we have a teacher network and we have a student network. So when it's the same image that goes through student teacher network. So this gives you two views already. So we wanna basically use contrastive learning to improve the present uh, uh, sort of representation. The issue is that how do you get the negative pairs? And that's where we rely on the so-called test time memory bank. So initially what happens is that the network uh, basically continues to sort of look at the scene. And as the, uh, the, the detector is making these detections, you, you, know, you look at these region proposal networks and for each uh, you know, pool feature, you basically have this classification as well as the bounding box regression. So for each feature, you have the class label. In other words, given uh, you know, as the, the 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 detector looks at various objects when it drives uh, you know uh, across the you know the streets, what have you, you basically keep on looking. You collect all kinds of objects that you see, and based on this classification, you basically build a memory bank. So let's say in pretty much any object detection framework, a priori we we, we sort of assume that we have k classes that we are dealing with. So let's say given uh, uh, this uh, you know ROI pool feature. The classification says it's a it's a pedestrian. Then you put it in a pedestrian class. The next time maybe it looks at a tree. Then you put it in the tree class. So basically, you build this memory bank just by detect, detecting various objects. And once the memory bank is full uh, during testing, given a, a, a sort of a feature, you basically sort of uh, you know do the query. So given this uh, you know feature, you see in what class it belongs to, and that's your positive class. All the features in the memory bank they basically give you these negative uh, samples. So with this positive and negative, now we can do contrastive learning, and now we can basically uh, uh, sort of improve the detection in real time. And these are different uh, loss functions. And this basically happens during testing. So you do this in an in a online fashion. So again, compared to uh, uh, the, the you know, sort of various domain adaptation methods like unsupervised domain adaptation, source-free, or test adaptation, uh, was shown to produce you know state of the art results, um, even though it does not have any uh, you know idea of what kind of images were used uh, uh, to train the source model. And these are uh, some additional experiments that we have done on uh, different data sets. Okay, so this slide basically shows um, how our detector improves upon previous uh, test time adaptations. The tent is uh, one of the first um, test time adaptation framework, and you can see that the uh, detector it really fails uh, detecting various objects in uh, you know far away, and our method basically detects them very well. Okay, and these are the, the sort of the visualization of um, you know the feature maps, and uh, I'll, I'll skip that because we are running out of time. Um, so that's basically uh, all. But I just want to briefly mention that in addition to what I presented, we have uh, developed uh, some other uh, detection frameworks where we do sort of category aware. So if you look at the unsupervised domain, you basically Align the distributions globally, but because it's uh, you know um, unsupervised domain adaptation, you have the knowledge of the uh, classes in the uh, source domain. Instead of doing the global alignment, you can do class-wise alignment, and in that case, you basically get improved uh, performance. And that's something we presented at CVPR twenty-one uh, to address the problem of uh, visible to thermal adaptation. Uh, we uh, developed a method uh, based on meta learning. Uh, we presented at WACWI last year. Um, and we have, uh, you know, I invite you to read the paper if you're interested in this topic. And we have also done some work on uh, 3D object detection for, uh, you know, LIDAR point clouds and other things. And this has some of the students who worked on, uh, uh, you know, this uh, topic with me at Hopkins. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in this uh, topic, we have uh, written a survey of unsupervised domain adaptation, which appeared in PAMI. So I invite you to sort of, uh, you know, read this uh, if you're interested in, in this topic. So with that, you know, I'll stop here and take questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Just, I found surprisingly most domain adaptation networks are based on two stages mm -hmm. uh, detector as fast as in. I think maybe one reason is because with the help of RPN, we can get some instance level features and yeah. also some instance level feature alignment or something like that. But in the practical view, maybe one stage detectors like Eulo series and also SSD is more practical. Yes. So I wonder if your work still can work on those one stage detectors like Eulos or something else. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, um, 
we have looked at uh, you know adapting uh, a YOLO or you know um, uh, deter or many other uh, detectors um, to you know various uh, conditions. So one of the issues that we um, you know um, were facing was that those detectors are extremely sensitive. You know, unlike uh, these two two stage detectors, um, as soon as you have some sort of uh, change in that you know the code base or the pipeline, it's extremely difficult to sort of you know, uh, uh, make them work. And that's just a bottleneck of the, the way that they are sort of the code base and, and the way they're, uh, you know, uh, designed. But but we, we have, uh, you know, some things which are basically, uh, uh, you know, um, something that we have not published, but we, we are doing exactly what you just proposed. Uh, why not basically take, you know, these approaches and, and uh, go after state-of-the-art detectors, which are YOLO-based and maybe DITER or what have you, right? So again, you can, there is nothing that stops you uh, from doing it, but it's just that sometimes there is this issue of uh, stability and it just it just doesn't work at times, right? Um, the, the code base and, and it's just very sensitive to, to you know, some changes uh, in the pipeline, yeah. Okay, thanks so much. You're welcome, yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you again, Vishal, for joining us uh, remotely. So let's give him a, a bit more applause. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again. So with that, I think we'll conclude uh, the morning section. Uh, we will have one hour and 30 minute break for lunch. And I uh, encourage you to come back at 1.30, at 1.30, um, so in this room. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the afternoon. Thank you. Uh,